Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 184. So glad you could join me. Today's guest is James Davis May. He'll be here in just a little bit. But before we begin, I should say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995, and we're... Um, just do it because we love poetry, because I know you do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed. Click the bell for notifications. Anything you can do to help spread poetry around the internet, the power is yours. You can do it. I'm talking to you. So write a review. Leave a you know leave a message. Leave stars. Uh, click the bell. Whatever you can do, spread poetry. That's what we do here, and that's what we ask of you as well. Now, before I begin with uh, James Davis May, our featured poet in this beautiful book, uh, Unusually Grand Ideas, we're going to share um, Sunday's Poets Respond poem. And um, Sunday's poem was by Michael Mayerhofer, a heartbreaking story. Uh, Michael can't be here. He's traveling right now. But um, um, I'm going to read the poem for him and um, or, or play the poem for him. This is his note. So he tells us this, this really tragic story. It's hard to hear. But... Um, this is the truth and uh, where poetry comes from. I have no idea how to describe what it's like to see your own stepbrother lying dead on TV. The same shy, good-natured guy I first met a few years ago on a family trip to Las Vegas. He was excited because I'd never met, been on a plane. He'd never been on a plane before. And who was looking forward to getting his life back together after making some mistakes when he was younger? But this poem mostly ended up being about my stepmom, who actually went back to work the day after it happened, partially because she couldn't bear the silence and grief at home. This is also only a few months after my biological brother lost his battle against leukemia, and partly because this is America, and like it or not, there are always bills to pay. So that was what Michael Mayerhofer had to say. And here is Michael reading his poem, After My Stepbrother Gets Shot and Killed by Cops in Milwaukee. After my stepbrother gets shot and killed by cops in Milwaukee. The day after she sees her son dragged from the street like roadkill, my stepmother returns to work. My father tries to stop her, afraid she might end up serving the same men they saw in the news, implacable Confederate statues finally granted an excuse to open their holsters. But right now, she'd rather hear the cash register than her own heartbeat. And so for hours, she fills bags with sandwiches plumed in lettuce and tiny cauldrons of broth, black forks with brittle tines, white napkins that stain so easily, pausing sometimes to dab her eyes or silence a buzzing phone. Strangers ask if she's all right. Just something I'm dealing with, she says, then takes what they give and returns what they're owed. And there's a heartbreaking poem by Michael Mayerhofer. I'm after my stepbrother gets shot and killed by cops in Milwaukee. Uh, Michael can't be here today, but um, he has a book coming out in the fall. So we'll have him as a main guest, I think, uh, when that comes out. But he's a great person to have a tough year with both his brother um, having been lost and then his stepbrother, too. Um, he came up here in uh, Wrightwood for um, one of our events and, and just was a great person. It's going to be great to talk to him on a Rattlecast coming up. But that was Sunday's poet, Michael Mayerhofer. Um, hope you enjoyed that poem. Now we're going to take a quick break, make sure everything's working right, and uh, get to our main guest, James Davis May. So sit tight, and I'll be right back with uh, with James.
And we're back. Thanks for your patience. Like I said, Mike, uh, James Davis May is the guest today. James is the author of Unusually Grand Ideas, this beautiful new book that just came out from Louisiana State University Press. Um, Unquiet Things was published by LSU Press in 2016 and named runner-up for the Georgia Author of the Year Award in Poetry. His poems have appeared in Five Points, Guernica, the Missouri Review, New England Review, the New Republic, all sorts of great places, as well as several issues of Rattle. He was also a Rattle Poetry Prize finalist a few years ago. Um, um, in 2016, his poem Ed Smith won the Poetry Society of America's Cecil Hemley Award. He's the assistant professor of English at Mercer University, where he directs the creative writing program and a 2021 National Endowment for the Arts Fellow in Poetry. And here he is, James Davis May. Hey, James, how you doing? Doing well, Tim. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to see you. Um, you know, it's been a while I've wanted to have you on the show because uh, Michael Mark um, keeps saying you got to have James Davis May on the show. And so you're one of those poets where I keep waiting for a book. And then finally you have a new book. And it's a beautiful book. I have to say, I read it cover to cover. Um, it's just wonderfully moving and, and just beautiful in the way it's written. Um, do you want to start with a poem so people can get a feel for it? And then we'll, we'll talk more about it. Well, well, thank you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for everybody uh, tuning in. Uh, so I'm going to start with uh, on page eight, uh, Red in Tooth and Claw, which was uh, in Rattle uh, a couple of years ago. So Red in Tooth and Claw. Even on the night my friend died, after a long illness, I won't use the word battle, but the cancer was gone. And then it came back like some slasher film killer. Even on that night, the feral cat the one that's white and fluffy and sometimes affectionate, still crossed our driveway, quietly, from our neighbor's pines to our rhododendrons. Even on that night, she would look for some rodent or bird to terrorize and mangle and maybe fully kill. And I, drinking and grieving on our deck, was appalled by the world and its gross refusal to stop being the world. And then embarrassed, not just by my own naivety, Though there's plenty of that, but by my innate human sickness that believes we matter, that someone is listening, that civility isn't just something we imagined and don't really follow anyway. That night, I wanted everything to be better than it is. So I went to the fridge, got out the milk, and poured it into a little bowl, which I left on the porch and found empty the next morning. Yeah, that was Red and Tooth and Claw, a poem that originally appeared in Rattle from uh, this gorgeous book, Unusually Grand Ideas, um, and a great title for the book, too. How would you characterize uh, what the book is about, first of all, just so everybody can get a sense of it? Yeah, well, I mean, the the, the title comes from one of the more poetic-sounding uh, side effects of antidepressants, and um, uh, it, it, um, it really starts, the book starts, the first section is about grief, and um, I think also, I've been reading from it a, a, a little bit lately since it's come out, and um, I'm also seeing that it was a little bit of an agnostic religious crisis, I think, too, that it was experiencing. Slowly near the end, uh, depression starts uh, sort of creeping in, and then in the second section of the book, it really takes hold um, and uh, really explores uh, sort of... Um, year-long depressive episode I had uh, that was um, pretty dangerous. Um, and then it moves in the third section to sort of reckoning what it's like to be living with that and um, trying to negotiate ways of, of uh, keeping it from taking hold, I guess is how I would say the, the book moves. Yeah, well, it really is a beautiful book. And um, and I think for, for two reasons, because it, it, it's so honest and, and um, you know, and so open about all the thoughts and feelings that you're having throughout the, the the episode, and then and also just the beauty of the the poetry. I mean, there's this long, intricate sentences that just weave themselves through the syntax and just great metaphors. It's a beautiful book in that regard too. Um, but but how does it feel to to write a book and have yourself so much on display? I mean, it, it's such a personal issue, and it's one of those things that that's taboo and we don't really talk about very often. How I don't know what the percentage is, but it's like. In any given year, is it like 20% of Americans have a depressive episode um, like that? It's a very common thing, I, you know, and, and it's something that we don't talk about. We had a um, tribute to poets with mental illness issue um, back, I think it was issue 56. And we talked a lot about that, about how it's just such a taboo subject that we don't address, even though, you know, a, a mental issue that pe someone's going through is the same as having some kind of like, you need surgery for some pancreas or something, you know, it's no different. Yeah. 
Um, you know, uh, there are some times that I feel like I, I send the poems out and they get accepted or whatever. And I, then I start fretting once the publication comes out. And there was a little bit of that at the at the sort of beginning. Um, uh, but the more I think about it, um, when I was going through that, um, the, particularly the, the, the major episode, I, I didn't know what it was at first. I wasn't sure what was happening. I thought I had an iron deficiency <laughs> um, or I, I, I just don't know what was happening. And then it just got worse and worse. And I thought, oh, well, I think I know what this might be. I think that if um, I if we talked about it a little bit more, if, if it were more open, I think I probably would have been able to say, oh, that's what that is. Um, and uh, so one of the things I think about when I you know, if I do start feeling a little weird, like, oh, gosh, here people um, I read, I, we had a book launch at my on my campus with my colleagues, my dean, and my students, um, and I'm reading these poems, I thought, well, you know, um, the worst case scenario is that, you know, we talk about it more. Um, and I think that's probably the way to approach uh, mental illness in general. So um, whenever I feel a little apprehensive, I just think, well, talking is a good thing. Um, so hopefully that's that's what's happening. Yeah. Did you know that you set out to write a book about this topic? Like when you started to put a manuscript together, was it one of those things where like, this is what all the poems were about and you started to recognize in a sort of organic process that, that there was this theme going on? No, I, I, I did not at all. Um, I was, I was writing a bunch of poems. This is, sounds like a horrible series. So, but I was writing a series of poems that imagined my own um, damnation uh, with various, um, you know, heroes. So there was, you know, damnation with David Letterman, uh, whatever. And, and I look back and I go, oh, well, yeah, I, I probably was depressed when I was writing those. Um, but after I, I started writing a few poems that I thought, oh, gosh, these are dark, but I'm going to I'm not really going to share them. I didn't even my wife is the poet Chelsea Rathburn. I didn't share them with her right away. And um, but they kept coming. Um, something opened up and I had um, uh, five or six very quickly and um, uh, I showed them to Chelsea and, and Michael Bark and um, they were very supportive of it and, and sort of that's how the theme announced itself. I don't you don't really always get much say in what kind of poems you're writing. And so um, they the poems kind of uh, announced themselves, let's say. Yeah, it always seems to me like poems are, you know, what the subconscious wants to say and you're kind of just transcribing for the for that part of your mind that that you don't normally have access to i guess is the way i think of poetry and so okay. things just come out um yeah well let's hear another poem uh what do you want to read next uh, we'll go to page 23 um this is sort of again in the first section but also maybe a sign that um uh grief and um how i deal with or how i was dealing with things um maybe things weren't going uh quite well. But also, I should say, too, the, the first section, the, the griefs are really about losing a lot of uh, good friends and uh, teachers in the poetry world. Um, so this is learning to cry in the parking garage. Because my f father never showed me how until I was 35 and his mother died and it was late, too late to learn from him. And because he taught me something else earlier, something dangerous, when he drove himself and my mother who led him to the hospital for his heart attack where they saw it open his chest after they put him under because of all that and so much else from others and myself i've come here like a hurt dog or the people we say are like hurt dogs to let my body heave itself into grief as i think about the friend i've just left who's clearly had a stroke months ago but still won't see a doctor that terrible slurring speech his half sunk face and dilated eyes. And then that feeling that he's already gone, that this is a beheading that will last months or years and that we have to watch it. I'm bent double now, sliding down the concrete wall, feeling both narcissistic and full of self-loathing, my head landing in my open palms. As I remember the others with their cancers, one in hospice, one unable to eat solid food, my poor, poor friends. And it's such a stupid thing to admit that I don't know how to do this, though my body seems to, just like it knows how to vomit. Here I am, underground, in the worst light humans have invented, the light of mines and warehouses, the air fetid and damp, where the stains don't decay and chewing gum turns charcoal black under the wheels. So my friends are dying, 
just as years ago, they were having children before me. And I climb back into my car and look for the ticket I'm worried I've lost, wiping my face with my useless sleeves. And that was um, Learning to Cry in the Parking Garage, again from this beautiful book, Unusually Grand Ideas, the second from James Davis May. Um, so so what was your, I mean, reading the first section of the book, it, it is such a, a tragic series of events. So many friends with cancer and, and the stroke that, that that poem mentions. Um, and when was it that, like, how was the experience of it, like, accumulating on you into that grief turning into depression? How long did that take? And, and when did you become aware of it? Um, well, I think maybe one thing to say is the grief kind of uh, my the first major death, I think, was um, Claudia Emerson, who was my editor for my first book. And um, uh, she passed away. She was such though I only knew her for about two years. I mean, every day I think about, well, Claudia's kindness continues to to help me out. And um, but um, I'd say. Um, I think it took about maybe three or four months to sort of realize, oh, gosh, this is really not going well. It went from feeling lethargic to I, I was sort of sprawled out on my table. I don't know if you've ever seen like a imagine a bored student in, uh, you know, sophomore math, um, that pose. Um, and I couldn't get out of it. And um, uh, I, I told my wife in I think it was June 2018 that I think things aren't going well. And by July, um, I remember I couldn't even drive. I couldn't, I could, I could walk on, you know, uh, good days, but it really was, um, uh, it started to become kind of debilitating. Um, I had no idea that that could happen. Um, so probably about three or four months to realize, oh, from grief, but also just something's wrong to, oh gosh, this is, this is not right at all. Mm -hmm. And how did you go about getting help? I mean, I think I used to work in a group home, um, uh, mostly with schizophrenic adults, but um, but also a whole bunch of other other issues going on. And, and the hardest thing is to sort of, you know, know that you need help first. But I think with depression, at least, it's, it's clear kind of that something's wrong in that way. Like once you rule out physical um, situations that might be causing like exhaustion and things like that. Um, what was the how did you go about getting help and, and how successful was that? Um, I, there's already a question here from um, Danny Masks, who asks if um, if you were taking antidepressants, um, and and is that something that that you got for help, or um, how did that how the process of healing go? Yeah, um, I I um, ended up calling my doctor, who um, is very good at diagnosing things under the phone, uh, over the phone. We were about two and a half hours uh, away from Atlanta, where our doctor is. We we lived in rural Georgia. Um, and uh, the healthcare system there uh, was not great. Um, I don't want to get in trouble for saying anything about um, anyone. But um, so I, I called him and just said, you know, I described things and he sent in a prescription and I ended up um, going to pick it up. I remember asking Chelsea after I had told her um, uh, maybe a month earlier that I said, hey, I, I'm not doing well. Um, I, I asked her, so I, I got the, the prescription, should I take it? And she looked at me like, you, you, you of course. Um, and so once I started taking them, I, it did sort of mobilize me. I felt a little like the, you know, the Tin Man with, you know, the finally gets oiled. I was able to start running, mm -hmm. um, which was uh, very good for me. Um, but uh, the other thing that happens is when you have antidepressants, you're sort of active enough to like think about really, really awful things too. Um, uh, so suicidal ideation uh, sort of picked up at that moment, which is again really scary. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I, um, that really though, getting, being able to move again was what kind of helped me and, and, and work through it, but it was a long, long process, um, therapy as well. And, um, really just the support of my wife, my friends, um, my, my family, um, my father, who is, um, was probably about 80 at the time calling me, uh, and saying if, uh, uh, if, I needed him to drive down from Pittsburgh. Um, he'd do it that night. So um, I, I had a lot of support in that way. Yeah, well, it's great to share the story because it's it's one of those things where it can really help people recognize what's going on with them. It's something that so many of us watching this show now are going to deal with um, at some point in our lives. And so having, you know, being open and sharing these kind of stories are really important. Um, how was it 
that you were able to continue writing poems with um, with that going on when it's difficult to get out of bed even. Um, you know, how are you how did you find the motivation to continue writing? Well, I don't think I was writing much at the time, um, but once I started to, particularly those poems that sort of addressed it, that turned a corner um, in some ways. It, again, it was, um, I think, probably around the time I started taking antidepressants um, that I started writing the poems about the depression. And that, I don't know, writing gives you a sense of, I don't know, anyone who's written a poem probably wouldn't believe me if I said writing gives you a sense of control because you have that thing on the page and it's not doing what you want it to do. But the ability to describe it, um, take ownership of it, to voice it, I think are um, really important things. And, you know, it's it's funny. I would tell my students, I, I, I really do believe that poetry can save you. And I would say that, but I never had the experience of poetry actually uh, saving me. And and then it, it helped. Uh, poetry wasn't the only thing, but it definitely helped. So, um, yeah, writing it, I think um, writing about it um, was one of the ways of sort of getting better. But at the time, the sort of, um, I think the darkest time, I don't think I was, I don't think I was writing anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, I know I talk about it a lot on the Rattlecast, but that that James Pennebaker's work and the, the healing power of expressive writing is just so important and how much um, you can be healed by sharing your thoughts and, and allowing that connection between the different the things in your mind that you're you're not accessing um, is such an important thing um, and so you know it's it's really interesting to hear that because a lot of times I talk to people and they say you know writing isn't therapy but but I think in a way writing is therapy isn't it I mean it's 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 I mean we can be looking at like the beautiful flowers and the butterflies or whatever but so much of what we're drawn to is um is that th those those connections that we need to make in the in the ways the things we need to understand that we don't and and understanding those things and coming to terms with them is such an important part of of psychological healing which leads to sleep and you know all sorts of things that let us lets us be healthier and and get our lives back together so it's so important to do yeah i i, I don't think there's ever been a problem that i've had that i haven't tried to write a poem about and that process always whether it's grief or um uh you know uh, some misunderstanding uh, i think i tend to work that way um so uh absolutely i i think it, if people say that writing isn't therapy well i i mean it's not just therapy but it, it it's certainly helpful um at least in my case mm -hmm. some people might not be writing poems for the same reasons yeah well let's hear another poem uh, what do you want to read next i'm gonna go to the second section the first poem on page 27 uh this is again about the experience of um, maybe one of those sort of the period before I told my family that I was what I was going through, but also not understanding it's called out too far. Um, so I'll go ahead and read out too far. Home from work, he's taken off his coat, turned off the light and laying in bed alone as he has done for months, though it's only five o'clock or so and his wife and daughter are downstairs wondering why he's not with them. His wife, he'll find out later, is worried he hates them. How to tell her that he sometimes doesn't know how he's ended up in bed, that he's not sleeping or even thinking, that he's gasping. And that's about it, that his day has been moving toward this moment, the dark room, a piece of driftwood for an unskilled swimmer who's gone out too far and pauses to gauge the distance he knows is likely to kill him. Still, through that distance, he hear he can hear voices he loves, wondering where he is. And that was out too far. Another one of the great poems in the book that really uses metaphor so well. And we just announced our um, Neil Postman Award for Metaphor winner for this year, um, which was uh, uh, Brian Morrison for um, Lighting the Rocket. But um, which is in the back of Rattle, the the spring issue of Rattle that just came out. But uh, the interesting thing in doing that prize is it exposes how few poems actually rely on metaphor and, and have metaphor operating really well. Um, how do you go about that? Because there's so many just great metaphors in, in the book, both extended like in that poem and, um, and in other poems as well. Um, how do you go about finding those metaphors and, and writing in that way? Well, I think I think they ultimately find me um, right. Like it, that's that idea. It's sort of like um, no one says I made an idea. I got an idea, right? So the metaphor. And I'm quoting my um, uh, one of my mentors, David Bottoms, the terrific poet. 
Um, and so he, he would say, you know, you don't make an idea, you get an idea. And I think maybe it's the same with metaphors sometimes, that the realization that this is like this. Um, and again, it's it's sort of um, a way of taking charge when you say, um, and, and um, I might revise my next poem just based on this conversation, um, what is it like to be depressed? Um, you're you're trying to communicate it to someone. And I think the only way to do it is through through metaphor saying it's it's like this. But often that the metaphor also kind of breaks, right? Every metaphor has its breaking point. Um, so um, where they come from, I don't know, but uh, thank whoever sends them uh, <laughs> for them. Um, so uh, would you mind if I read a poem that sort of addresses this? Yeah, yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, please do. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, account on page 29. And so this is about telling my wife, you know, that, that I am depressed. Account. Are you a danger to yourself? My wife asked after I told her I was depressed, that I felt as though my face were melting from my skull and that I had to hold a huge medicine ball as close to too heavy to carry it as it could be, but it was getting heavier. And then I recognized the metaphors didn't work, that language couldn't carry this thing any better than I could. Was I a danger to myself? I liked myself less than the dinner I couldn't eat and would throw away. Still, I paused at the question, paused each time I heard it from the few I told, because it made me feel as though I were in a bank with a stranger who could have been my friend, except he kept too close, definitely too close, as I asked the teller for everything in my account, and she gestured with her eyes toward the button that trips the silent alarm and calls the police, but I shook my head and said nothing except thank you as she handed me the money. And that was a count, again, from unusually grand ideas. And that's the thing that, that poets can do that, um, that we need so much in society to understand what people are going through when they go through this. It's, it's so many people going through these kind of major depressive episodes. It, it's a very common thing. And I remember I was um, just as like 23 years old. I was a psychiatric counselor at a group home. Um, and, and I had no idea. I was trying to talk to somebody. And, and I was trying to, I mean, they don't give you any training at all, <laughs> except for like a psychology classes and things like that in college. But, but I had no idea what it was like to, to go through that and, and to, you know, everything I, I found, everything I would say was just so naive. And it's because we don't talk about this. We don't talk about how it feels not to be able to experience any kind of joy which is, I guess, the, the fundamental thing. There's just there's some kind of like motivational impulse that's like pleasure-seeking. But when you can't seek pleasure and you can't feel pleasure, there's no reason to move. And it's so hard to explain that to anybody who, you know, hasn't experienced that or hasn't, um, you know, talked to somebody who has and can articulate it really well. Yeah, it definitely. I mean, I, I really appreciate that story. Um, and I, I'm thinking, too, of, um, you know, I talked to, people who have dealt with depression and, and you know sometimes there's like the, the we talk about the like things you should never say to people who are depressed like um you know smile more just mm -hmm. you thought of getting out and getting some exercise or um uh there is one i, I i'm not going to read the poem but I, I do have a poem about you'll tell people you're depressed and then they'll say well why didn't you say anything earlier well i'm, I'm telling you now um but i, I I mean, I, I think that's definitely true that we, we there is um, sometimes when telling people or when people tell us, um, I don't know if we always uh, react the, the right way. Um, and I know I, I probably in the past didn't react very well. And um, I, I think, again, talking about it more and more is the only way to to improve those um, reactions. Mm hmm. Well, um, let's talk about poetry in, in general more. How did you come to be a poet? Is it something you've always done? Um, I, I, from the first poem I read of yours, it was brilliant. And, um, and, and every poem since has been great. Um, how long have you been writing? Is it something that you, you know, as a young kid, you started out writing or did you pick it up later like, like some people do? Yeah, I, um, I, I, the first poem I ever wrote was about the uh, Pittsburgh Penguins winning the Stanley Cup. <laughs> Um, and it was something like uh, the Penguins won the Stanley Cup in 1991. They went for two in 92, and it was so much fun. <laughs> I, I was in fifth grade. Not, I wasn't, you know, 30 or anything. Uh, <laughs> but um, I started writing these poems. I was a hockey player, um, as the poem would suggest. 
And um, I went off to, I would write them in high school. I never really showed them to anyone. They were very private. And I went off to um, um, uh, college, got cut from a hockey team at a college I won't mention, and then ended up with uh, going to Allegheny College, which is not far from Rochester. And um, there I um, I um, met a poet named Christopher Bakken, who's a terrific poet, but and a, and a really um, terrific teacher too. And he was also a hockey player. And so I was able to say, oh, well, I can do this. Um, but at the time I was reading mainly just Robert Frost, um, who was um, actually the patron saint of this book. He's, he's in there quite a bit. Um, but I was reading Robert Frost and, and writing poems, but not showing them. And then I took a, a workshop and um, I really didn't really look back. I, I think I wanted to be a lawyer because uh, that's what my parents are. Um, mm -hmm. But they they also told me I would have been a bad lawyer. And I think they're right about that. <laughs> um so um i became a poet yeah that's interesting the first hockey playing poet i think we've had on the <laughs> rattle cast so far not very common yeah. um so so how um how did you develop your your style of writing i mean we talk a lot of as poets about voice and you do have a very unique voice um and how is it that you you come to sort of own your own voice how does that work there's a certain style that these poems have that um, you know, I think one of the things that, that has a lot in, that the poems have a lot in common are longer sentences that, that sort of flow yeah. down the page with a lot of complicated clauses and a lot of movement before you're sort of given a chance to breathe, maybe. Um, how did you develop your own voice as a poet? Um, I think, well, I, I mentioned I was reading um, uh, Robert Frost a lot and I, uh, Christopher Bakken, again, I was in his workshop and I turned in like I think a sonnet that had the word hark in it, but it wasn't, you know, <laughs> ironic at all. And so he pulled me aside and said, OK, you're going to put Robert Frost away for a while. Um, and he told me to read Cheslav Miłosz. Um, and I, I really fell in love with Miłosz and then also his translator, uh, Robert Haas, his work. And I think the Haas is a great sentence maker. And um, I think that probably had something to do with it. Um, and um, so I, I I think there's there's a moment where you have to get away from the thing that you love the most, uh, you know, your biggest influence. And I think that was getting away from Frost. Mm -hmm. But in the book, when I started, um, I started reading him again, um, actually, when I was depressed, I, I probably put him away for 15 years or so and came back and I was like, oh, my gosh, this uh, talk about a poet who who really writes a lot about depression. Um, so uh, I think moving away from sort of more metrical and into po poets who, who think more about the sentence. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's probably ultimately what happened. Yeah. That's right. Why do you think poetry has moved away from, from meter and uh, you know, into that focus on the sentence, which is, I guess a good way to put it. Um, you know, cause a lot of times we do get, which um, you know, my response is, well, if you, if you don't hear the music, you don't have an ear for the music maybe. Yeah. But a lot of people, you know, just see a poem and they say, well, it doesn't rhyme. That's not a poem. It's just prose with line breaks. Is that the prose with line breaks line? I get daily, <laughs> or at least yeah. at least a couple of times a week. Someone says that, um, and, and so so how what do, what do you think is gained by abandoning meter and rhyme? Oh well, um, hmm. um, what's gained? Um, I, I I mean I'm not sure about. Um, I, I don't know how to answer that quite. Um, I have to think about that. Um, I think that it, maybe it's not that anything is gained, but you're, you're just exploring things in a different way. And I don't think that meter is ever really completely gone, right? If it's, I mean, if you're writing in English, there's some sort of meter um, that's trying to maybe pronounce itself. Um, uh, but, you know, rhyme, I, 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 those people who can rhyme, I, I really admire them, um, but I, I am not one of them. And, um, my my wife is an excellent um, a, a formal poet, though she writes um, doesn't always write in form, I should say. Um, but when I rhyme, it's uh, you know she'll look at me like, "What are you thinking here? <laughs> that's not a rhyme at all. Um, that's that's not even a half rhyme. It's a you know eighth of a rhyme." Um, so I, I don't know if I just I, I guess I just don't have the ear for rhyme, and I, I left it pretty um, pretty early. Um, is anything gained by it? I, I think it's just the way my voice comes out and it, that's what works for me. Mm -hmm. But who knows? Maybe the next book will have rhymes. <laughs> no, it won't. Yeah, probably. <laughs> That'd be interesting though. Let's hear, hear the next poem. What, what's next? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to page 34. Okay. Um, 
And this um, this poem's about um, we're talking about well, what does it feel like to be depressed? And um, uh, I really one of the places that I was like, oh gosh, um, I'm not I'm not well. Uh, we took our daughter to Disney World, which I already have. Um, I, I've never been a Disney fan. No offense if you if anyone out there is a Disney fan, but I really not a, a fan. And I was there and just um, I was just plunging. And um, the only if you've ever seen uh, We Are the World, you know, the song back in the 80s, there's a, a moment where Bob Dylan is singing and just looking completely lost. <laughs> and that's that's exactly how I felt, um, though I didn't look that cool. Um, so this is uh, um, this is about to, this is to my daughter and um, uh, whose name is Addie. And it's about that trip, um, but also what we did before the trip and then um, what happened afterwards. So this is called A Note About the Cinderella Pumpkins. We dampened the paper towel just to the point of its capacity to carry water and still retain its shape. Then we folded it like a letter, slid it into a freezer bag and dotted it with last year's seeds, finally putting the package here on this desk that catches the morning light and heats up enough in spring to make writing here unbearable, which it was that spring, which it almost everything was that spring. And Addie, we left that bag alone for more than a week while we went on vacation where I, if you're reading this, you're old enough to know, if one is ever old enough to know, thought quite seriously about wanting to die. Even though everywhere I looked, people, especially you, were joyful. It was Disney World after all. Forgive me, love, my difficulties with joy, which I've always found puzzling. Drunkenness, yes, I understand that. Happiness, sometimes. But the way you smiled at the princess as she greeted you, the bounce in your knees, all seemed a foreign language I wanted to learn but couldn't. When we returned, the bag, clouded like a greenhouse, swelled with vines, some still half in seeds like baby cartoon chicks wearing parts of their shells. We planted them near the souvenir fairy house you adorned with flowers and notes to welcome the fairies you were sure would show. Notes you found the next day answered in tiny, tiny script and sprinkled with purple glitter. Concrete proof of what you've always known, that there is magic. You inspected while I watched on, not sure how much longer you'd believe that I, like you, was excited and convinced. Yeah, another great poem. Uh, that was uh, a note about the Cinderella pumpkins. We're reading poems from Unusually Grand Ideas, the new book from LSU Press by James Davis May. And, and that poem in particular, James, made me, made me think about how wonderful it would be to have poems that are this honest about your own parents. Because we, you know, we have no idea as kids what our parents are going through. And then to have such, you know, such clarity in the, the telling of what you're experiencing and thinking um, is that something that you think about as you're writing this book, that, that your daughter will be reading this book someday and understanding you better than she ever could have without the poems? Yeah, I think ultimately I, I hope that happens. Um, you know, she is 11 and uh, both her parents are poets. And so she's been to so many poetry <laughs> readings and had so many poems written about her. She's cool with it, but I also understand her just being like, OK, guys, um, it's Funny though, she um, she every now and then will write a poem and hand it to us, and um, she'll do exactly what I do when I hand a poem to my wife. I'll act like I'm doing something else in the house, like not paying attention to the reaction. Um, but I, I did dedicate the book to to both um, uh, Addie and and my wife, and um, I, I do hope that someday she'll she'll read it and and sort of say, oh, that's what that's what's going that was what was going on. She she knows about generally what was going on. We're, we're very honest with her too. Um, and I think that's a good thing to let your kids know about um, what mental illness is. Um, but um, I hope someday she'll, she'll read it and not be, um, oh God, um, <laughs> there, there I am again. Yeah. Well, that, that kind of brings up a question I'm always curious about is just what you think the purpose of poetry is. Like we were sitting around here, we, we spend so much time writing poems you know, we, with the books, with the, the podcasts, with the magazines, all the submissions and waiting for rejections and, and all the things that we do as poets going to conferences like the AWP, I think, is this week. Um, what, what is it that, that is the 
purpose? Like, what is the purpose of a poem in your mind? What do, what do you think of as the reason why you're doing all this? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it is uh, one, the purpose of reading a poem is to see what it's like to be somebody else, mm -hmm. um, teaching empathy. And sometimes we find ourselves in there, too. Um, students are very fond now of saying a poem is relatable. And I used to kind of cringe at that because like, well, relatable to whom? But I think when you see yourself in someone else's uh, poem, well, that's pretty powerful, particularly if the person is, you know, doesn't have anything like your background. Mm -hmm. um, so it's one to reading it, but I think also writing it, um, uh, you you understand yourself a little bit better. Um, and um, I, I, I kind of hesitate on this one, but I, I do think that, um, and I'm kind of thinking about what how Cheslav Miłosz approached poetry, but this idea that if if you don't put it down, if you don't get it down in, in writing, um, it, oblivion wins. Oblivion will take that um, uh, uh, moment and you won't have it anymore. It, it won't last long. Um, and how long does a poem last? Well, I don't know, but, um, you know, we are we're still reading poems from, uh, you know, centuries ago. Um, so I, I do think that, that that's almost like a religious reason for liking poetry is to think about how it, it does kind of uh, speak against oblivion. So I'm getting very mystical here, Tim. I'm sorry. Um, no, but, I, um, the more mystical, yeah. the better. I love yeah. mystical poetry talk. It is probably my favorite subject. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> good. So I, I do think it's it's um, it's I think in um, uh, one of the poems, it's a longer poem. I won't read it tonight, but it says it's one way of scoring a. a you know, a point against oblivion in this blowout. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so from a mystical level, since you brought that up, I'm always kind of wondering if where poems come from is a really interesting question to me. Because on the sort of the rational side, it, it all comes from you and your subconscious and the way your brain connections work and the things you're not aware of and the different hemispheres. But then yeah. and the way it feels, it feels like you're channeling something. There's some collective thing going on that's bigger than just you. And poets all the time talk about channeling some kind of like voice that's not there, some kind of bigger collective. Do you ever feel like that? Or to you, do you think poetry is all coming from the recesses of your own mind? Is it very individual or is it very collective? Because I can see it both ways. Well, I think there's part of me that, um, you know, I'm... I'm um... I'm the I'm made of the poems I've read, um, and so there's that right. So that's the one way of channeling, bringing things in, but not just the poems I've read, but everything I've experienced, and um, and then it has some way of um, of sort of uh, working its way out into a into a poem. Um, so I, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, uh, I, 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 I in addition to Frost, one of the other, you know, the poets I actually liked were Wordsworth and Coleridge. And um, that idea that that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of emotion, but everybody forgets the whole recollected in tranquility, that sort of revising side of things, right? People sometimes think it's, oh, just first thought, best thought. Um, where do they come from, though? Again, I'm going to go to David Bottoms, who said, um, has a great little essay called uh, something about turning your uh, uh, turning your antenna on or get, uh, making sure you can receive that signal. Um, uh, years ago, I was in uh, Krakow, Poland, and um, uh, Philip Levine was there, and he talked about how his job as a poet is if he gets some idea, um, his job is to get out of bed and start working on it. And he really did imagine it. He sort of described it um, to the, the crowd um, as a, an idea sort of flying out like a meteor almost. And he said, if it doesn't, if he doesn't get out, it'll probably pass him. And I think he said, go on to Adrian Rich down, you know, the next city over or whatever. Um, so um, I, I think both. So ultimately, I'm saying both. It comes from within, but also comes from without. And I mean, they're so mysterious. I, I, I kind of don't actually want to know you know people are talking about ai and writing poems and things like that but i, I really don't want to know anything about how yeah. a poem is actually um made <laughs> yeah well it's interesting because ai might finally be the answer but but there's no there's sort of no time i believe carl jung and the whole collective unconscious thing more than when you're writing a poem or experiencing a poem that really connects with you it feels like there's some kind of deeper consciousness in communication with each other. There really is this mystical feeling to it. And, and, and I don't know. And if AI can write a good poem, then maybe we'll know that there is something more or, or maybe not. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how that works. So far, all the AI poems are terrible. But I've seen yeah. Them, and it's sort of like, 
<laughs> yeah, why would you want AI to write a poem too? I, I mean, it, it would be like, I don't know, um, this is crass, but what, would you want AI to have sex for you? No, you <laughs> wouldn't. Um, at least I hope not. Um, but no, I think um, Jung has that thing about um, the purpose of art is to sort of go down into the collective con uh, unconscious and, uh, uh, and and pull out the symbol that the age needs. I do believe in that a little bit. Like we get the poems that we need, maybe not necessarily the poems we want, both as individuals and then um, as as a um, as a culture, we, we get the poems that we need, at least ideally. Yeah, well, that's a good thing to mention, too, because I think, you know, this is a book of poems we need now because there's so much really anxiety and depression going on. I think we're we're unique in the known universe as species that are aware of our own mortality and our own suffering. And and I think maybe what's happening is that as we have more freedom to think and, and you know, expand our understanding of things, through science and technology and, and all the, you know, the, the freedom from just the day-to-day -day grind of living. Like, we don't have to be out there plowing fields all day on our hands and knees, you know, being like four foot four and like, you know, dying at 33 because of, you know, malnutrition. So now we get to have so much more time to think. And then we can think. We, we think more about our state in the world and and all the things we could worry about and, there's really an epidemic, especially since the the smartphones came out of anxiety, which leads to depression. Um, and so it feels like like a book that we need right now. Um, it, and why do you think that is? I kind of went through a whole bunch of reasons of my own thinking about why all those things are on the rise, but they clearly are. Why do you think that, that depression and anxiety are so much more common now than they used to be? You know, I, I, I'm I don't know. Um, I, I, part of me thinks that, um, well, we're, we're probably a little bit more open about talking about it. And mm -hmm. so I can think back to um, uh, some people in my life that I, I look back and go, oh, <laughs> um, uh, that person was depressed at the time. And I wish I had had known. And it's not that person's fault for not knowing, because, um, again, I didn't know um, what was going on either. Um, so I think we might be better at describing it and, and identifying it, but not much better. Um, is it um, having more time to think, having more time, and also just having more life? Uh, probably, but, um, um, uh, you know, there is something very kind of soulless. Uh, if you, I know I'm on Facebook right now uh, live, but you, you hop on Facebook long enough and Twitter long enough, you it, it could cause depression um, a little bit, but, I, I'm being a little silly here, but probably I shouldn't be. Um, but I, I don't ultimately know why it's more common now. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's certainly, we could speculate a lot um, about why. Yeah. Well, um, it's just great discussion. Let's have more poem, though, too. I want to make yeah. sure we get to enough. Uh, let's read another one. Absolutely. So um, I thought, uh, you know, we're, um, uh, why not? Um, you know, one of the things I like about Rattle, uh, one of the many things I like about Rattle is that, you know, um, uh, poems go everywhere and they can go into difficult subjects and um, also funny. And 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 um, so I'm going to read on page 44, a poem called Hot Sex. So again, this is still in the depression, depressive um, uh, section too. Hot Sex. They finished lunch and gone upstairs where they begin making love, the tender but urgent sex of a married couple with an empty house for an afternoon. They kiss and he caresses her, but soon she breaks off her soft song of pleasure to say, that's hot. Which he takes as keep going, but really what she means is that it's hot as in burning. And then she asks him, resigned panic in her voice, did you slice one of those serranos into the guac? He did, he tells her. And then he realizes the implications, tripping over his apologies, but she tells him that stopping makes it worse and pulls him closer so they're joined and he feels it too until they move fast enough it seems to outrun the pain and they're laughing between breaths and moans laughing at the pain they know will be there when they stop and that was hot sex and a bunch of these poems too have humor come in in that way um, which is a way you know when you describe the book as a book that deals with depression um, you know, you think that it's not going to be fun to read, and then it ends up being such a beautiful book and with such a variation of, of topics and styles and ways of approaching the subject matter like that. Um, 
were, were you conscious of that as you put the book together? Is that one of the things, like, did you add a poem like that to add some lightness to the darker stuff? Or is it more like this is just how it came out organically? Yeah, well, I think, uh, I mean, one thing, um, there's a great podcast called um, Depression Mode with John Moe. I don't know if um, you've come across it, but um, it's about, it's the subtitle is The Hilarious World of Depression. Um, and so, I mean, even depression has its funny moments, um, uh, for sure, particularly when you're looking back at them and going, oh, um, but um, no, I didn't, I, I think, um, uh, you know, my my wife reading these poems, experiencing the poems was not, um, uh, obviously not fun for her, but uh, it was very difficult to read them too. And this poem in particular, I think, kind of one of the ideas in the back of my head was, gosh, I haven't really made her laugh with a poem in a while. And so I, I wanted to do that. I, I also have a, I've developed a tradition of writing at least one like incredibly embarrassing poem per book. <laughs> we I have another one, a love poem to her about the time we had um, food poisoning together um, in my first book. It's it's yeah. Um, but um, no, I think that's how I experienced the world. I mean, even when I um, even at pretty dark moments, I, I have a tendency to make jokes and it sometimes gets me into trouble, um, you know, having, um, a, a, you know, thinking a funny thought at a time when it wouldn't be appropriate, but that's where my mind goes. So uh, plus humor and and often humor, humor like poetry can go into darker places, I think. And that's comedy. Uh, that's one of comedy's strengths as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody loves on the chat. Uh, Nate Jacob says that poem was so good. I need a cigarette and I don't even smoke. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it is, oh. it's, it's a great to, to get to those poems. There are a few poems that, that have, that have humor is the, like the central aspect I'd say. And uh, they really break up. And, and the thing, there's that contrast principle too, where you can experience the, the grief and the difficulty, you know, when they're juxtaposed against lighter things too, it makes it more powerful when you turn the page and it's a, a more poignant poem. Um, so it really works that kind of playing between the ordering of the book. Um, how much of thought went into the ordering like that? Were you thinking of like, well, I got to get them with this, you know, hot sex, and then I can go to somewhere deeper later, and and that'll buy me a little bit of, um, you know, capital to to go darker. Yeah, I I tried to. I mean, the poems are kind of chronological in the way of experiencing depression. That mm -hmm. and you know, I I really do need to credit my wife who. Um, you know, it, it really understands how to put a book together. And um, I don't, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty bad at it. Actually, I sort of show up with, you know, all the loose uh, papers and say help. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I think that was sort of the idea to get from here's where it went. But the humor, um, hopefully, it, it's sort of um, sprinkled throughout. But um, uh, I, I don't think I consciously thought, okay, now it's time for for a funny one. Um, as much as what fits the the sort of feeling and so in this poem though it's a you know a, it's a funny poem there is that sort of that idea that the pain is going to be there after this this moment ends um so there's there's a sort of maybe a darker side to that poem too yeah well we have time for maybe two more poems um okay. and, and let me uh, say uh, if anybody has any questions for james uh leave them on the chat windows either on facebook or youtube and i'll pass any questions along and people are just loving the poems but i don't I haven't seen any real questions yet so if you have any questions you have one more shot to leave a question for jim uh but let's do this the penultimate poem now which what yeah, do you want to read i'm, I'm going to do on uh, page 65 a poem called moonflowers and uh, this is from the third section of the book. And again, I think it's a moment of, of sort of moving uh, towards something different. In fact, um, it's maybe one of the brighter poems in the book. So, um, and Moonflowers, I think, I mean, it's like what the name sounds like. They're flowers that open up around, uh, around dusk. So Moonflowers. Tonight at dusk, we linger by the fence around the garden, watching the wound husks of moonflowers unclench themselves slowly almost too slow for us to see they're moving. You notice only when you look away and back until the bloom decides or seems to decide the tease is over and throws its petals backwards like a sail in wind. A suddenness about this as though it screams, almost the way a newborn screams at pain and want and cold. And I still hear that cry and the shout across the garden to say another flower is about to break. I go to where my daughter stands, flowers strung along the vine like Christmas lights, one not yet lit. We praise the world by making others see what we see. So now she points and feels what must be pride when the bloom unlocks itself from itself 
and then she turns to look at me. Yeah, beautiful upon those moonflowers again from unusual grand, unusually grand ideas by James Davis May. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, your wife is a great poet too, and you mentioned already sharing poems um, and and you know revising and working on the editing process together. What is that like to have a great poet as a wife and then and then work on poems together? Is there like a competitiveness to it or do you just you know support and and help each other not embarrass each other or something? I mean, what is the what's the mood of of your interactions there well i mean it's i, I can't say I, I, that's what, I had a similar question recently and i said um well i can't speak to like what it's like to for everybody to be married to a poet but i can say what it's like to be married to chelsea rathburn it's absolutely wonderful um but uh, there's not really a competitive competitiveness over um, the poems, but every now and then something will happen. I don't know, you know, our, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see a, a fox and there'll be like this race to get back to the computers to see who could write the first fox poem. Um, but also what happens, which I, I really enjoy, is that we have a tendency to write poems uh, that respond to um, each other's poems. Um, she has a poem about uh, the poem I read earlier out too far about sort of maybe it's out too far from her perspective. And, um, uh, it's a, a really moving poem. Um, and so I, I, I think there's just this sense of, um, when we are writing, um, it's, it's, uh, really there's creativity kind of is buzzing through the air and, um, it's, uh, one of the best ways, usually when she writes a poem, I'll write a poem and vice versa. There's sort of a, uh, we egg each other on that way. Um, when we're not writing, though, it, it's, you know, we're, we're both kind of have that anxiety. Um, so um, there are, are um, some moments where it's like, oh, gosh, we're, we're suffering together. <laughs> and what's your writing process itself like? Uh, you haven't really mentioned that yet. Um, you know, how are you one of the poets that, that write every day and, and then like one out of 10 poems work? Or are you one of those poets who, who you know, pick a needle and, and massage a poem for a month and then finally have a poem and then you move on to the next one? How, how does the, what does the process work for you as far as revision and, and how the impetus comes from a poem? Like, how do you know where a poem is and how to get into it? Yeah, I, I never, I'm definitely not one of those people who writes every day. I, I can't do that. Um, uh, I, I might read every day, um, but not write every day. Um, and um, at the times I have, it it just has not worked out. Um, uh, I've tried that. Um, but usually it's, a, if, if um, I'm not too busy, if life isn't too hectic, I'm about a poem a month person. Mm. Um, it's nice to have something to go to and, and come back to. And um, usually it's a line. Um, it's a line that some, some, and usually it's the first line. And it's just the sort of matter of trying to figure out what comes next. Um, I don't know what that says about me, um, but um, I will start writing it and um, I usually hold on to it for a while. And lately I've been holding on to it longer than I normally would. I'll say, okay, I'm gonna give it one more day before I show it even to Chelsea. And then I show it to Chelsea and, uh, um, she will look at it. She does this really cool thing where she can flip the pen up while she's reading. Um, and it's <laughs> kind of intimidating. Um, but, uh, she'll look at it and say, it's not ready yet. And so I, I say, yes, you're right. And then I, I go back and, and, uh, um, work on it some more and show it again. And eventually, um, after that, it goes off to Michael Mark usually. And, um, uh, he, he gives me uh, terrific feedback. Um, he really understands how poems work. Um, so uh, then eventually I think, okay, it's, it's, it's there, but um, yeah, it's, it's normally a, it's nice to have a poem a month to just sort of uh, work with it. I, I think that um, if I wrote more than that, my, my poems would all sound the same. Maybe they do. I don't know. Uh, but, no, they they yeah. definitely don't. Cause you, you know, there's just so much beauty in, in the, the movement between different images and, and metaphors. It's just, you know, poem to poem, they're all different. Although the voice does have something in common and uh, Michael Mark is here. And he says, uh, yeah, he says, Jim, I trust the voice in your poems. Um, can you speak about that? How, uh, trusting the voice. Um, and then uh, Dick Westheimer, too, says, great question. Trust was just what I was thinking and feeling. And that's the thing that really does stand out to me uh, when reading your poems, is that I believe that you're being as honest as possible. And there's something about that that's just, we want to hear people's honest stories. I think we're really drawn to that. There's so much fakeness. We talked a little bit about social media, but I mean, the reason why Facebook and Twitter and Instagram are depressing is because it's so fake, <laughs> you know, and the news is so fake and and just... 
you know, Hollywood is fake and video games are fake and everything is fake. And so when we hear an authentic voice that we can trust is being honest, like we're really drawn to that. So how do you develop that? Um, how do you develop that voice? Uh, well, I, thank you. Um, I, I, what I would say about that is it took me a long time to realize that I should be writing about my experience um, or maybe it should, but that's what I should do. I, I mean, I, when you're, um, you know, 21 or whatever, and you, you start thinking, well, no one would care about what's going on here. So I have to go off and find another subject. And I think there are poets who can do that. They're, they're sort of poets who can project themselves uh, off. You know, those are the Keatsian people. And I love Keats, but I'm no Keats. I'm more of a Wordsworth, right? Um, where it's reflection. And it took me a while, though, to realize that. Um, and um, uh, but that's what I do now. I think the poems uh, the poems, I, I think I said earlier something about I've never had a problem that I haven't written a poem about. And so they normally start with a problem and it's a working through that problem um, uh, that maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah. And then uh, one last question, then we'll do one last poem. But uh, Lana Ayers is here and she asks him, how do you know when a poem is finished? It, which so it goes along with the revising. If you have a poem a month, is it like, oh, my month's up and now it's finished? <laughs> or do you, is there a sense that, that you've gotten to the resolution of the problem? How do you know that a poem's finished? And, and it's not like a false finish that you just think is done, but it's not because you can pick at poems forever, you know? Yeah, there is a sense. I think I, I, I think I know when I'm lying to myself and I'm like, oh, well, that one's ready to go out to, to rattle. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, no, it's it really. And I kind of know when I'm doing that. I kind of kind of could tell when I'm, I'm and so I try not to, but um, reading them out loud, I think really helps because if, if it, if you can't hear the, uh, uh, the possible uh, effect, um, someone, if you can't imagine someone responding to it, well, that's probably a sign that it's not, not quite there yet. Um, but again, it helps to have um, a poet uh, uh, in bed next to you. Uh, well, that, that's not exactly what I meant, um, uh, but you get the idea, right? It, it helps to have a poet in your house, <laughs> not just in bed. Yeah, Jesus. for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, it is, though. Do, do you find yourself like even reading the poems here? There's there's that story. I can't remember who it was, um, but somebody who was going through and every time they'd go into a town, they'd find their book in a bookstore and like change a couple words with a pen. <laughs> um, do, do you feel that like looking back at the poem now that it's out in a print? Do you do you still feel like you're fiddling with it or once it's, it's done, you put it aside and you're just done? Yeah, I, I, I have um, many neuroses, but that um, that sounds like it would be absolutely horrible to me, and though I would totally understand it. But I think whatever um, has happened, I, I was looking through the book today and I realized I didn't use an Oxford comma someplace. Um, and I thought, oh, gosh. Um, uh, but um, uh, no, I think once the poem's published, I, it does feel kind of uh, final. I think, I mean, I know uh, Robert Lowell would... Um, uh, changes poems even after publication from uh, collection to selected or collected, uh, or I guess it was only selected. Um, but I'm, I, I don't have that problem quite yet. Um, so I don't know if I would, but um, looking through the book, I don't really find any things that I think, oh gosh. Um, and it also, you know, there is a, this is a, um, you know, it's just, it's kind of a slender book for um, compared to, you know, a lot of the collections that are, are out. And I left a lot um, of poems out of the book um, uh, because I just didn't think that they worked. And so maybe it was in part because they weren't finished too. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's some advice that, that I think is really good advice that you never hear is that there are probably too many poems in most poetry books. I think I, like when I read a book, that's the main criticism that I don't really tell anybody, but it's huh. like, you know, 80% of the poems are great, but 20% don't live up to the rest. And I think maybe a shorter volume is better. So I think it may be one of the strengths of the, of the book is it's more slender. Yeah, I, I, uh, you know, I mentioned Claudia Emerson earlier. She said she liked her collections at fighting weight. <laughs> yeah, look, that's good. If you look back at her, her books, they're all, um, I mean, they are all um, – uh, lean. I can't imagine taking a poem out of out of them. Um, and so uh, that's someone who I, I, you know, was thinking about, it, of course, when putting the book together to thinking about what what Claudia would do. She would actually I, I heard um, she actually told my wife that she would write the table of contents ahead of time sometimes oh, yeah. um, to think about her book. So that's something I'm kind of practicing with a little bit. 
Yeah, well, I talked to Ron Kirchie a few times on the Rattlecast, um, and he's one of the best. Every time I'm at a reading, I'm amazed at how many books he sells. And I asked him what his <laughs> secret was, and he was like, "Well, be 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 engaging and personable, and then leave him wanting more. Don't overdo it." <laughs> that, <that's, laughs> and he does. I mean, if he has a 20 minute reading, he'll do 13 minutes. You know, and there's something to that, I think. And um, I don't know. It was a powerful experience reading this book. It's a wonderful one. Um, but we're about out of time, and you wanted to close out on a newer poem. Yeah. So, so yeah. my favorite moment in poetry reading is actually when the poet puts down the book and says here's what i've been working on lately um my wife's third book was about postpartum depression mine's about clinical depression and um we keep joking that our next books are going to be about joy huh. probably not going to happen but i've been writing a series of poems lately that are about um uh thankfulness and um they're all sort of titled after um what i'd call agnostic saints and so this is the uh you know, the patron saint of traffic lights. It's about experience. Um, you know, my daughter fell backwards, hit her head. Um, she was okay, but it's about that experience of rushing her to the hospital and uh, this small little miracle that happened. So this is the patron saint of traffic lights. My child is in the back seat with her mother and can't understand what's happening. Keeps forgetting we've already told her that she fainted and hit her head hard on the living room stone floor that we're going to the hospital downtown that has a special doctor for kids. But everything will be all right, and though she doesn't believe our reassurances, knows, even concussed, that we would lie to calm her, she listens each time until we pause, and then she blinks, and the awful loop repeats itself. What happened? Where are we going? But what's also happening is that all the lights are green and have been green for miles, each one ushering us on, some turning right before I'm about to break, some not needing to change, unblinking eyes watching us approach from far down the street, the same street I will drive on much later when all will be well, when my daughter will know what happened and I will be late for a meeting or so hungry that just thinking will feel like anger and the light will stop me and, as promised, I won't curse or hit the steering wheel, I won't even sigh but instead will look up and remember the small miracle I received when I needed it. And that pauses like these are also needed to revive my gratitude, which should be ongoing, steady, constant, without end. Yeah, beautiful new poem, The Patron Saint of Traffic Lights. Can't wait for that to come out uh, whenever it does in your next book. It's, this book, uh, Unusually Grand Ideas, is such a wonderful book. I hope everybody picks up a copy if you don't already have it yet. And James, so great to talk to you. Such an important topic and, and really fun talking poetry all night. I had a, a great time, Tim. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for all you do for poetry. Yeah, well, definitely my pleasure. It's it's just a, a nothing but a pleasure to get to do this every week. So uh, for, thanks for being here and, and hope to have you out again soon. All right. Thank yep. you. Take care. That was James Davis May. Um, his book, once again, is Unusually Grand Ideas with that beautiful cover. Um, you can find more of James' work at his website, jamesdavismay.com, um, just like it sounds, James Davis May. Um, now we're going to take a quick break and go to the open lines. So don't go anywhere. If you'd like to share poems, I'm going to put the... Um, the uh, links up into the show notes. You can share poems about anything you would like. So you can share poems about current events. You can share poems from the prompt from last week. You can share poems that you published recently and are proud of and want to share. That's always fun, especially if you can shout out to other literary magazines. We always like that. So if you would like to share poems, go first. Here, I'll put it up on screen. Go to um, email your poem to open mic. That's open M-I-C at rattle.com. Email it there um, so I can show it on screen like I was showing James' poems earlier. Um, then everybody will be able to read along. And then follow the Zoom link that I'm about to deploy on Facebook and YouTube. If you'd like to just sit back and listen and enjoy poems, don't go anywhere. We're staying on the same broadcast. But only if you'd like to share poems, hop on this Zoom link. Um, and I'll be right back with the open lines.
back thanks for your patience let me really quickly fix the lighting on myself this is one of those it's that time of year where when i start the show i am very brightly lit and i think it's just gonna stay like that and then um let's see and then it changes and uh, the sun goes down very rapidly in the mountains here and uh, it got really dark so let me uh let me try to brighten it up a little bit <laughs> before we start um let's see that's a little better that's a little better okay yeah yeah, that's a little better. Okay. So the prompt for this week was to write a poem about a time you faced a moral dilemma. And that's because last week's guest was Abby E. Murray. Um, and her book was about being a pacifist while her husband is a soldier. And my poem, I wrote a, uh, a sonnet here about um, one of the moral dilemmas. It just keeps coming back. I try to write a poem about this. And um, I, I've tried to write, like, I think I wrote a short story about this and a poem about this, and it never really works. And uh, so this is like my third attempt at telling the story. The problem is that the story is too, um, like, it seems like fiction because it's just so ironic. The irony is too deep, but it's a totally true story. So this is Chris from the liquor store. And I might have even read a poem about this uh, a couple of years ago. We're, we're almost four years into the Rattlecast. I can't even remember what I've written poems about. I think I might have read, read a poem that, that didn't work about this before. But here's another shot at this moral dilemma poem. Uh, a little sonnet here. Um, and here we go. This is um, Chris from the liquor store. The first thing filched a boot of bourbon slipped inside his winter coat. And then a fifth of fireball schnapps, a snow globe flecked with flakes of gold. Inside his baggy pants, he strapped the heavy bottles of his shibboleth, Macallan, decades aged and double flasked. The knowledge came that no one noticed this, no inventory tracks, no log or list. He started stealing by the case and straight into his car, La Roche Grand Cru and Blanc de Blanc. One night he held a tasting late. We paused before we drank, but still we drank. He sold the rest and bought the motorbike that killed him. Now we know what karma's like. So that is too ironic to even write about. I don't even know if that works. But really, this guy I knew, Chris, he um, stole about $30,000 worth of stuff from the liquor store we worked at, bought a um, Yamaha motorcycle, and immediately crashed it and died. And um, a tragic story, but, but that's karma. So uh, that's my first one. And then last week, I didn't have a poem. Because I, I got back late from shoveling, I wrote a really quick poem. Last week's prompt was to um, take an emotion and then write it as a simile for a, um, a grammatical term. So I picked deja vu, which is kind of more of a feeling than an emotion, but I thought it'd be interesting. And then I found this, uh, this grammatical term, met metania, or metanoia, metanoia. And that is when you're in speech, like I just did. Uh, like I planned it out and correct yourself. So when you correct yourself in speech and say, what I meant was, and, and clarify and correct what you said, that's metanoia. So this is deja vu is metanoia, a really short poem here, but, but I wanted to, to keep up on my pace of doing a poem every week. So here we go. Um, deja vu is metanoia. So what if the world is just a memory of a memory rewriting itself? So what if the old man rolls over in his sleep? There's snow on the road, the chimneys smoke, his wife is there, ready to wake him. That is my little poem, Deja Vu is Metanoia. Now let's go to the open lines. We have a whole bunch of people here. Definitely one poem each. Um, uh, definitely, yeah, we have 18 people on the lines. So keep it to one. Let's go. We'll go in the order people are here. Let's go to Katie Dozier first. Hi, Tim. Hey, Katie. How are you doing today? Great. I love the show tonight. It was so good. It was fascinating. The poems have been so great. Yeah, an important topic. And James is a great poet. Um, everybody's got to get a copy of this book because it, it, it's one of the best books we've had on, I think, uh, this year. I think the poems inside seem to be even prettier than the cover, which is really saying something. <laughs> it is saying something. This cover is gorgeous. And it's timely, too, with all the balloons in the air. It's almost like the universe conjured it or something. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I particularly thought the poem about Disney World was very interesting and the idea of like having honesty as a parent. And it's kind of where my prompt poem went this mm -hmm. week too. Um, this is about when I was little and I was just, so I was trying to face like being honest about our own parents and stuff growing up. And then you guys were talking about it. So it was perfect. Yeah, perfect. Well, let's hear it. This is pirouette, right? Yeah, it's a sauna minus one, obviously, because that's the only form I'm capable of writing. <laughs> <It turns. laughs> okay, this is called pirouette. I was swishing down the stairs. A poofy pink dress has no cares, no unfrosted affairs. The world was one jeté. Ribbon twirls of yesterday atop a dancing flame. Grainy words can boil sugar, burn the caramel. Apples tumbled down, uncandied. I held a core up to a limb, begged the branch to reclaim the fruit, but the leaves fell on my tutu, turned me mute. Yeah, excellent poem. That sonnet minus one, the uh, rhyme at the end there, the 13 line <laughs> sonnet. And um, in Katie, of course, the, the host of uh, The Poetry Space, which I'm the co host on every Thursday on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, find Katie underscore Dozier off this week, but we'll be back next week talking about metaphor, which is perfect because uh, next week Brian Morrison is going to be here at the beginning of the show, the, the Neil Postman Award for Metaphor winner. So uh, that's perfect. Yeah, it's Thursdays. Uh, Mary Lisa. Um, Dominesis. Ah, I can't do it, say it right. Sorry, Mary Lisa. Um, she asked what time, and that is uh, 3 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays. So you can join in. The poetry or Twitter spaces are like a group call. It's really fun to do. Everybody can join in and talk. So a, a different kind of format where this is like one on one. That's just like a freewheeling discussion and like a conference call or something. It's a lot of fun. So looking forward <laughs> to that, Katie, and uh, hope you have a good night. Me too. Maybe we don't call it a conference call if we want people to show up. <laughs> okay, it's not like a conference call. It's a, con it's, a, it's a fun, it's a fun, I don't know, how she do? A fun conference call. Yeah, there you a go. There, there's call. donuts. Okay, <laughs> All right, thanks so much okay. for everything tonight, Tim. Great show. Bye. Yep, take care. Thanks. Yeah, it was uh, Katie Dozier with um, Parouette. Next up, let's go to Dick Westheimer. Hey, Tim. Hey, Dick, another regular on the uh, poetry space over there on Twitter. Good to see you here, too. Oh, always. yeah. I'm, I'm going to miss my fix this week. That's uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll probably just show up because it's 3 o'clock on Thursday. Yeah, well, there you go. It's, it's good. To, it's good. It's it's so fun. It, I, I love it. I love all three of the things I get to do every week. I love it. It's my favorite, I think, is, is just doing these shows. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm attending these shows. Um, well, I know you've got a, you've got a load tonight. I, I'm sure everybody will say, but the interview with Jim was was wonderful, really good good stuff. So thank thanks Michael Mark for uh, for making it happen. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so what what is it that you want to share? Oh gosh, I think I'll do uh, this Odyssey of those set off as refugees. I send it as a poet's response, just because it's so different than my normal voice and i want to hear myself read it out loud to a crowd interesting yeah that is that is a way to learn you know because you can trick yourself i think when you're just in your room by yourself but then when it's been broadcast to people you know the truth <laughs> yeah absolutely so it's a great can, it's really it is a great it as, you're, as you're reading it and and sort of the conceit of this was there was a boat of refugees that crashed off the coast of Calabria, within miles of where Odysseus's boat crashed. Oh yeah, um, yeah, right, right on those same rocks. When you know one of the, I don't know, twenty times his boats were destroyed, but this was the last of his crew, and uh, there just seemed like there was something there. So I, I, I tried to sort of have the register of epic poetry without getting getting too over the top here. Mm -hmm. So uh, the odyssey of those set off as refugees. And this is in memory of the dead and respect to the living refugees from Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan, whose boat broke up on the rocks of Calabria. And uh, Homer from, from the odyssey, from the same rocks, like sea crows, they were born on the waves about the black ship and the god took them from their returning. Hey, sweetie, how are you? The rocks of Calabria scythed all six of Odysseus's crew from his unnamed boat. In our time, another ship breaks on those same shoals, 160 foundered on the coast's sharp stones. 
No Homer among them sung of sea crows, no bard noted their wings, soaked by frost cord foam. No poet king marked their hundred sixty cries, frozen above the ravening sea. The hundred sixty wished to wake in beds not made of stones, to breathe something besides the bones of crows, to eat without trembling hands and hear without ears lanced by mortar blasts. They set sail west from Ilium. In a boat may be named so little hope to their own Ithaca, not the soft body of home promised in the hero's tale, but some refuge from wickedness. The voyagers knew nothing of wine-dark seas until they left Troy's shores. But now they know enough to compose a hundred epic poems, some with refrains that never end, some where every line rhymes with dread, some wrought in a syntax no one living will ever comprehend. And who, and we who hear their calls, who will memorize the wailing, immortalize the tales of each of those slashed at the heels back home? Who will sing of all those scythed by waves and rocks and sustain those huddled on the shore with something more than prophecies and poems? Yeah, great poem is always like definitely a different style. Um, love the voice, the odyssey of those set off as refugees, and uh, important topic too. That to you know not forget that stuff like this happens, and you know we look the other way so often. Yeah, well, thank, thanks, Tim. Yeah, it felt felt kind of good to read it. That that that's an issue. <laughs> yeah, good sign. Well, I'm glad to hear it. Thanks, thanks, Dick. Great poem. Thanks, all. Bye. Okay, bye. That was Dick Westheimer with the Odyssey of Those Who Set Off as Refugees. Uh, we're going to divert a little bit from um, just going in order. And I want to make sure I get to the first time callers because there's so many on the line. So let's go. Uh, Rob Harris is next. We have a few people who've never been here before. So let's uh, do Rob Harris. Hi. Uh, yeah, I've been here a couple oh, of times. Oh, you have been here. Well, a, a few times. Yeah. 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 So well, do you want me to go back in the line? No, later? no, it's fine. You haven't been on much. Okay. We also got Maggie Lopez just to see. And then uh, David Cohen, I think, has never been on. Those are the people I can't remember anyway. So, so we'll do okay. it here. But uh, what do you got for us, I'll, Rob? I'll wait until the first time, people. That's no, fine, no, you're huh? good because you haven't been off in at least. Okay. So let's let's okay. do. What do you got? Well, I have two. One is really short, and one is kind of long. So um, okay, well, let's do the short one because we got 16 people on the call. Oh, okay. really like short it. though. <laughs> this was it is it's a haiku. Um, uh -huh. This one is in for poet's response. Um, oh, the long one's not long. Do both, but do the haiku first. Okay, the first one is uh, about Dilbert. Um, I'm sure we ho we heard the story uh -huh. about the the creator and all the stupid things he said. So uh, I figured Dilbert, after 33 years, was good for a, a sign off haiku, and it goes like this: <laughs> Alas, poor Dilbert, your creator's a moron. You had a good run. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah 33 thanks. years he's gone we don't have to see him anymore um so uh that was the the long one or the short one rather i think the uh, office the is kind of dying anyway too <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> good timing i don't know how many people work in an office anymore anyway exactly well it, yeah i won't miss it to, to be honest yeah. um <laughs> but the other one um let's see if i can find it here i'm sorry it's uh can you pull it up on the screen i'm trying to find it on my on my uh -huh. You know what? Can I, can, can I come back? Yeah, why don't you come well, back? Um, yeah, come back and we'll okay. do that one. Sure. It's only a page. Sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, let's go next Thanks. then to who did I say? Yeah, let's go to uh, David Cohen. And it might be that you, you, you know, the people who I think of as first time callers have been on once or twice, but uh, but I don't remember if <laughs> there's a lot no, of people. So, hey, David, have you been on before? No. Uh, ah, can well, you hear me great okay? to see you. Yeah, I hear you great. Uh, so, where are you calling great. from? I'm calling from Atlanta, uh -huh. and uh, I just caught about half the program, uh, and it was wonderful, and I saw the thing, so I didn't realize there was a prompt some people were working against, uh, and we have been in the Twitter space together. I, I go by Doodle Slice on ah, Twitter. Ah, good to see you. Yeah, so from the poetry and, space, great to have the crossover. Yeah, it's good to see yeah. it instead of just hearing. <laughs> so uh, this is something new. Mm -hmm. It's called Old Man Robin. Okay, yeah. Is there anything I want to say about it before you dive in, introduce it, or just... Um, 
No, I think I'll just go since it's the first time. And uh, I, I tend to write with a touch of whimsy. So there you go. That's great. Yeah, let's hear it. Glimpsing through strands of silver haired morning, a spot of color in the mist, rusty orange pride swelling a robin's feathered vest. Younger birds warble and sing, gossiping happily, sharing tales of lemon trees, winter escapades, and southern hospitality. The robin sits quietly aground, a gentleman in retirement, preoccupied with memories of blue shell broods once perched in the family tree. He cocks his head to the left, hearing the soft rumble of a tunneling earthworm, plump and juicy. It's good to be an early bird. This will be a good spring, green and warm, he thinks, maybe even one more nesting. But the stiffness in his wings casts doubts upon his, his seasons. Every bird knows slow wings are cat's best friend, but there is a reaper's mercy in claws, swift and sharp. On this early spring day, the robin gulps his worm and sings a cheerful song as the morning sun smiles away the gray. Uh, excellent. Yeah, great poem for this time of year. And I wish that I could say the same for, for out the window here because we still have that. I think it's down, like it's melted down to like four feet of snow. <laughs> or, or anyway, <laughs> a little warmer in Atlanta. Yeah, not, no, <laughs> sense of, uh, no sense of robins or worms, but I'm looking forward to that day when I see my first worm. It'll be nice. <laughs> thanks for sharing that, uh, Bruce. Also Thank known you. as Doodle Slice. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for joining. Yeah, that was uh, Bruce Cohen again with uh, Old Man Robin. And then we had another first timer. Let's see, where was that? Maybe she is gone. That's why I want to get the first timers first, because they tend not to stick around. Yeah, okay, well, we'll go back to uh, regular order of received. And Carla Schwartz is up next. Hello, can you hear me? I can. Good to hear you, Carla. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Um, still have snow here, too, and happy for that. <laughs> well, definitely and, the uh, trees will be very happy. It, it, hopefully it'll make fire season not be as bad and also um that i'm really looking forward to the wildflowers because in the you know like april and may we have great wildflowers here and with the water they should be really happy so i'm looking forward to that uh it's definitely good <laughs> yeah so um my poem is a prompt poem and i guess my most biggest <clears throat> moral dilemma is of reading it and so, it's, <laughs> so it's called my sister worries my sister worries about the small things and the big the world full of worries the wars the climate change the streams desiccation my sister my older sister is like a child easily taken in couldn't we all be as she takes in threats of legal suits of insects, rodents, and other infestations? My sister worries about the small things and the big, what might be brought into her house on the soles of her vegan sneakers. My sister leans on her university degrees, her NYU MFA, insists she's an expert to communicate. My sister worries about the small things and the big. I find it hard not to lose it, not to explode when I just want to help her. For example, to compose a letter to her accountant, a man she hires to solve her inability to understand all things financial, what she readily admits. She twists the sentences I dictate to her breaks them and stirs them into a salad and then blames me. I just wrote what you said, she says, when enough, the, when enough of the words don't make any sense. I don't know how to really help her, my sister who worries about the small things and the big, to explain she needs more help than the tarot cards can give. I can't help but worry my older baby sister who worries about the small things and the big who wilts with the least insinuation that she could seek help. 
she'd explode in self-defense. I feel helpless to help her, but I'm all she has. Yeah, excellent honesty there too, Carla. And that's Carla Schwartz from CB99 Videos from the um, chat windows, of course. So if you you see her there, check out her YouTube page. But thanks, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, Carla. Definitely um, you know, the moral dilemma there. And maybe it's one of those things where it'd be a good thing if she you know, came across that poem, right? <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. All yeah. right, thank you. Thank you, okay, thank cool. you. Okay, cool. Thanks, Carla. Always yep. a pleasure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Bye. That was uh, Carla Schwartz with My Sister Worries. Um, Mary Lisa Di Dominicis, which I, I, that's how I say it in my head, but I know it's wrong. Can you tell me one more time, Mary Lisa? I'm sorry. <laughs> sure. No problem. It's Di Do Men Ish Is. Menicious. Okay. Di Dominicis. Di Dominicis. I got it this time. I should stop saying Di <laughs> Di Dominicis. Di Dominicis. Okay. Di Dominicis. Perfect. Yeah. Well, I think I might be able to keep track of it this time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Fine. I but, swear. Yeah, wonderful fine. poems. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what you have to share. What is it that you would like to share today? Thank you so much. Okay. So this is um, in response. It's uh, um, to oh, uh, moral dilemma. Okay. Mm-hmm. And it's called a quiet night. A quiet night. Um, hang on one second. I'm trying to pull it up. Let's okay. see. It That's good. Take me, time. Yeah. It logged me out really quick. So. I haven't read it out loud yet, so, (laughs) but I think it's a poem that's been waiting to be written and, you know, it's rough, but. Oh, I don't have it actually, unless it's going to spam. Let me check spam. Maybe. Did it go through? It should have gone through. Why don't I, why don't we circle back to you? Because it's really fun to be able to read the poems. Okay. I'll send it again. I'll go. Totally. I'll check my email. Yeah. To open mic at rattle.com, send it again, and then we'll circle back to you. Because it's nice to watch the, to see the poem too. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, Let's go back to to Rob Harris, speaking of circling back. And uh, do you have your poem yet, Rob? Yes, I do. Excellent. Um, um, I don't know if anyone uh, on the call is familiar with Chicago or not, but there was a bookstore on the north side called Bookman's Corner. It was in the Lakeview neighborhood. It's about a half a mile south of Wrigley Field. It was a a corner uh, nondescript building on Clark Street, and it was run by one man named John Chandler. Hmm. And... uh, he suddenly passed away. He was 89 years old. Um, and the, the worst part is there's no closure, really. I mean, there's no farewell sale. There's no, uh, it's basically just the shop is boarded up. And, uh, that's uh, too bad, yeah. I was trying to find some closure, so I decided to create my own. I wrote this, and I taped it up on the door of his shop, and it oh, was like it. And I'm, I'm hoping that other people who uh, love and appreciate books and the people who run bookstores can can get something out of this it's called farewell to a bookman and his corner uh it goes like this everyone who loves books the smell of them the way they feel in our hands how they accompany us all through our lives lost a friend when john chandler passed away he ran a bookstore on the north side of chicago called bookman's corner which was teeming with books of all sizes and genres and subjects John provided a public service by offering up stacks of books, rare, medium, and well done for those who were willing to seek out whatever they could find. If you walked out of his shop without a few new treasures and at bargain prices too, then you probably didn't enjoy reading all that much. His passing reminds us all that books heavy and the ideas that they hold have this wonderful capacity to outlive any, any one of us. There were no final clearance sales at John's shop in Chicago, no final looks at the merchandise, and no opportunity to thank him for providing us bookworms was such a special place to navigate. Cherish the people and places that you think will never go away because in time, all of them will. And all that will remain are memories as incomplete and reliable as they always tend to be. Oh, that's great. Great use of poetry to put that up on the on the store there. Hope hope people read it and enjoy it and I, maybe, I hope so. Yeah, and, uh, maybe add their own poems too would be nice. You know, if if something like that could happen. That's great, great way to use poetry. Thank you. I, I appreciate the chance to read it. it. It wasn't like, you know, when a Barnes and Noble shuts down and there's like a going out of business sale and you can go there and yeah. kind of like, you know, make peace with the fact that it's it's shutting down. There wasn't any of that. Yeah, so, I mean, well, that's I, too bad. And unfortunately, so many bookstores are shutting down. Just it had, it's been going on for 20 years and it doesn't really stop. Eventually, we won't have any left. The world needs more bookstores, not fewer. I Definitely. Think, so. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Well, thanks so much thank, for sharing. Thank you that. for Thank you for letting me read it. I appreciate it. Yeah, Very yeah. Much. My pleasure. That was Rob Harris again with um, uh, Farewell to a Bookman and His Corner. And we have Mary Lisa's poem. So let's pop Mary Lisa back on. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know why it didn't send, but it just took a second and it, it came, I guess you have it now. Yeah, I have it right here, Quiet Night. So what was it, this was a, was this a prompt poem or um, I can't remember what you said. It was actually, it was in response to a moral dilemma, but I think it's a poem that's been waiting to be written for a long time. And this is a first draft, so bear with me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> mm. um, okay, A Quiet Night. My father doesn't yank me by the hair, drag me home. I'm grown. He punches me in the jaw instead, flings me over his shoulder, carries me down the dormitory steps, and tosses me into the back seat of his two-door V8 1974 Plymouth satellite coupe, where two of my uncles wait. I'm outnumbered. Back home, my mother drinks tea with my aunt in the kitchen. Cigarette smoke, only partially, veiling their faces, sour with rage. My family doesn't say they're happy I'm in love. They sit me down and in serious tones, without shouting or yelling, claim they've a contract out to break my boyfriend's legs should I see him again. And they're packing me up to send me to live with my aunt in Bristol, Connecticut, where the only things for miles are thrift stores and strip malls. I protest. They warn, don't test them. Dad's got ties to the mob where he works at the concrete plant. And yet, even as I believe them, I plan my escape. Wait for the kettle to warm, then whistle as my mother rises to pour another cup of tea. When she gets up, I get up, the back door of the house behind me. I push it open and run away through the rain as fast as I can. Through the mud, my father one foot behind me in his heavy boots, and who knows who else. I refuse to look back, but I've lost them. And I'm panting when I reach the alley where the yellow cabs are lined up, ready to save me. Take me somewhere other than to the dorm where, when they return, they hack the door to splinters with an ax. And I think, thank God I wasn't there. I think, thank God my back wasn't pressed against the door as the blade sliced through the silence they were sure was me wow frightening poem thanks so much for sharing that mary lisa it's great that is a, a quiet night yeah yeah thanks for sharing that always a pleasure to see you thank you so yep. much fun yep. great great interview awesome take care yeah that was um mary lisa de dominicius hopefully i said that right that time a quiet night excellent poem let's go next to uh jerry stephenson Good evening, Tim. Hey, Jerry. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing really good tonight. Yourself? I'm doing great. It's a really fun night of poetry. A lot of good stuff. It's been a wonderful show. And and, and you're still conserving your snow. I'm amazed. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how long. It's there, there is a rainstorm. We You know, we have softball season and Little League season starting up. <laughs> and I want the field cleared. So I hope, it, I hope the rain comes over the weekend and, and melts some of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got a prompt poem for you tonight. Okay, let me pull. Oh, here we go. Okay, I got it. Okay. Right. Now, it's, uh, it was a learning curve for me, too. It's called Bietel Home. Hmm. Now, Bietel, I thought, was an Icelandic word. I'm an Icelander. Yeah. So when I researched the word, it's not an Icelandic word. Oh, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a universal word. It means two vines that grow together and have a bean. So oh. anyways. Well, you learned something Bietel. every day. I didn't know that either. <laughs> I never would. I grew up with it. Bietel Home. <laughs> it's full of older Icelanders and Ukrainian women hmm. and men. It's anyways. So here it is. That's the thing. Uh, uh, and it's between myself, my brother, and my sister. And get to home. Get to home. As clocks wind down, as batteries run down, as folk wind down, options appear clear. Affirmation terrorizing. We three all agree this was the best alternative. Homework all in a file. Many pluses, no negative alternative. Hence our position common, option very obvious, only alternative. Coin in the air, fingers crossed, who of us three, no alternative. So we would tell our mother she'll be moving without alternative. Though afflicted, she bloody well knew this is the last stretch about to ensue. All hard, we despise the term have her committed, hence no alternative. 
Yeah, beautiful poem and fascinating uh, metaphor there for Bieto home. It's something I had never heard of before. Yeah, very interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Jerry. Thank you very much, Tim. Yeah. Take care. Great show tonight, too. I just, if I didn't have shoes on, he'd have knocked my socks off. <laughs> great. Well, that's great to hear. Thanks, Thanks, so, Thanks so, as so, always, so Jerry. Much. Yeah. Take good care, man. Yep, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. It was Jerry Stephenson with um, Bieto home. And let's 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 jump ahead a little bit because because Lucy Chow is always last. I think it's because of the <laughs> delay. Let's do uh, let's do Lucy next, and then we'll go back to the order they were received. I think it might be because there's a, a delay. Lucy's in China, so it's got to go a long way. And I think maybe she gets the link last. Hey, Lucy, how you doing today? Hi, I'm good. Yeah, excellent. Great weather here. Yeah, the sound quality is good too. I think the new the new setup you have, whatever you're on, is much better. So, what do you have you like to share? Um, I have a prompt poem, and it's a, just a little bit long, so I guess um, I'll plunge straight in and read it. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I send it at, as an attachment. You, you have got yeah, that, Yeah, how right? to be near a river and not scare it, right? Okay, yeah. Okay, go ahead. That is it. How to be near a river and not scare it. Many water birds wade and wander and whine over these wilds, she says expectantly. A chic picnic mat rolled tight and neat under her arm. I gaze far, wondering what use are binoculars in sighting stars swamped in light, birds hiding in sheer air. We tread on firm, dry land, touching water by tying eyes onto the thin, blurred line where a poplar's bowl and its inverse image are fluidly spliced. Early March, her jaw cracks like a spark fallen into some baked stubbles of reeds. Have you ever heard of scorched earth literature? Scorched earth, that which is left after fire's final predatory breath drew the last drop of wet. That phrase rubs against the soft, harsh scuffing of my soles on sere leaves and rustles into skewed whispers. Scratched earth, as in scratch it, as in this is my scratch paper. Scared earth, curled under my tongue like a tiny newborn. I want to walk far from mats, hammocks, tents, angled canvas domes, shading inflatable sofas, foldable chairs, and hot pot paraphernalia. After miles along the winding bank, I find a severed pole tap in the budding meadow, the very blue of bird's eye, as if the small silent breath of Veronica petals sways the meadow in azure patina. Still no birds in sight, still only ghosts swim the river. Not a feather save those who lose from battered badminton shadowcocks. The sky keeps its blue, dividing, indifferent. Man is a thinking reed, birds dare not hover near. Men are a matting clump of which they steer clear. I walk and walk, unmanning my mind. If there ceases to be any trace of my species in the rustling and crushing of my clumsy steps, they might consider curiously my bedraggled shoelaces before scattering. A pair of geese pass far overhead so far they cast no shadow. A fledgling eider carefully rides the axis of symmetry of the white river surface, its strategy to maximize distance from humans on both sides. Even magpies would not return to sit on their nests in poplars. There are more kites in trees than nests. A white heron stands on its steel blue stilts on a tree on an island so far away, the branches have softened into smoke. In the sudden fire of this first warm day, the smirchless wings are not a bit scorched. Suddenly, a kingfisher catches fire, blue, green, Aquamarine, ultramarine, cerulean, cyprian. No, before words of hue or luster can catch on or catch up, it flashes into a clump of beige reeds and never flashes out on the other side. I peer into the impenetrable tangle and see no feather, no fire. 
Has the kingfisher simply snuffed itself out? Or what has snuffed it? When I grumbled to her about the dilemma of love, where I draw near loved life, who then draws away, such has grown the rift between us about mere presence of man, enough to evict the rest of creation from their restful homes. About any parkland, wet or not, being always already scratched, scarred, scared, perhaps even scorched, she makes an apology. I think a mob of lions or tigers or androids will equally scare birds off their quiet abodes. Yes, I think aloud. Any fire, a smallest wick, a flame, pointed, pale blue, leaping from the valve of a lighter left among wildflowers. Mostly, the small human happiness on sunny banks flashes non-disruptively, but two here are throwing fireworks into the center of the river, trying to rout fish from their deep hiding. Sometimes when we forget how prayers work, we turn to summoning by violence. I ponder the long, sharp beak of the vanished kingfisher and pray, come, come, bird, come seize me with your burnished terror. Whisk me anywhere, for I have dared to step near your sanctuary. Oh, take me, teach me your fear. Yeah, great poem. Thanks them again for sharing that, Lucy. Um, great, rich with details as always. And uh, for those just listening, the, the poem itself is sort of a river flowing down the page, maybe with some waterfalls in the middle, some different uh, different levels of, of uh, curves and things. Very fascinating poem there, uh, How to Be Near a River and Not Scare It. Thanks so much, Lucy. Always a pleasure. Uh, next up, let's go uh, Bye, to... Tim. Oh, yeah. Yeah, bye, Lucy. Take care. And next up, let's go to Mike Bales. Uh, good night tonight. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Mike. yeah I'm going to have you. to listen to him some more. Um, I learned from friends. I didn't quite become a social worker, but I learned from Fellow friends, you don't have to be a social worker to help people. You just write good pieces about some issue. Mm -hmm. For me, and one of my books is writing about Alzheimer's and the added Alzheimer's. Yeah, I think the listening too. You know, listening comes first. Listening to people and then writing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I read one book, one poem from the Rockford Review. Mm -hmm. I've got another. It. This is the winter. The fall winter edition. Mm -hmm. um, it's put out by the Rockford Writers Guild in Rockford, Illinois. Oh, very cool. I had another poem uh -huh. that I sent you, the one that I didn't read the last time. That's Home for the Creative Class? Right. That was about a really nice coffee shop that I talked about here mm -hmm. where we do readings and a lot of creatives go to. That It's called Roz Talks. I've mentioned it before. Uh -huh. yeah, I remember, yeah. It's a really nice mm -hmm. place. And... This is home for the creative class. A poet sits on a stool next to a construction worker wearing a reflective vest who hunches over the counter as he takes a break from street repair. A college philosophy instructor sits on a couch facing a student as he discusses the works of Kant while someone reviews a draft of a screenplay on a laptop. The owner behind the counter brews a blend of Chinese tea and with great care lets it seep steep. Conversations among patrons swirl in the black ground, a black and white foreign movie flickers on a television while life's meanings are pondered. Small paintings hang in walls, textures and colors of an artist's soul on display and for sale for a minimal price. Chairs in and out of the room face a stage where poets and storytellers read and recite their works and feel the love of those who stay well into the night. Every day we remember the owner's mother who passed and the time she put a positive spin on the lives of everyone she met. Each day the mural painted on the street outside by a summer youth project greets the early sun as the city awakens to its dreams. Oh, that's great. Great portrait of a really wonderful place. I wish I uh, got to experience that, home for the creative class. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, oh, Mike. It it's wonderful. It's, it's really nice when it reopened to let people inside after the pandemic. Yeah, definitely. That's one of the things I wish we had something 
like that around here. You know, it's such a small town where I live, so it's there's not a whole lot. There was a bookstore for a little while, but they moved to Alaska. <laughs> now it's a oh, now it's a, a long that'd be a long drive. Yeah, definitely <laughs> would. That's a jujitsu studio, so it's a quite the turn <laughs> of events. But anyway, thanks, Mike, for sharing that. Yeah, okay. definitely. Thanks. Yep. Take care. That's Mike Bales with a home for the creative class. Let's jump to Guy Chambers. Hello there. Hey, Guy. How you doing tonight? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah, this is going to be the poem here. It's from my book, uh, Flying Kites in the Moonlight. As I mentioned I had one poem last week I read. So this is another one from the book there. Yeah, I love that title, by the way. Flying Kites okay. in the Moonlight. That's great. Yeah, I like the title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this one poem is called Lady Poet. A, la- a poet laying under a tree. Reading a book nearby on a blue sky in a given afternoon shade. The thumb through, absorbing into pages that talk to her. Mind's eye untied, nipples hard to the breeze. Words so pleasing, folk song candles, word drift dreams, infatuated envisions. Amazed that it all closes eyes, fall into a daydream that talks to her. Reaching within, give voice to another place on a footbridge that belongs to her. <clears throat> Glancing over the edge, staring through the fingers beyond on red picture. Peer at, hold in, reflect. Blur one other self to the past that never had. Have at heart in that place in one's bones. Taken over by songful verses. Rhythmical, graceful, flowing adventure. Walking in the moon in a morning dew. So inspiring. Making up as it goes. Breathe into the ear of a living pi- pictures, revealing secrets to endure, while wishing that they they be true. Risk the b- b- behold and an un- unfold. Undertake new journeys that seem not has been, wishing they will come real. But behind. A friend in a whisper grasps her world, placing it in a book for her eyes to realize when next time to read, she is there. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I Sorry about everybody listening. I had a different version, I think. But uh, yeah, thanks for sharing that, Guy. Great poem as always. Great picture painted with words. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. (laughs) Yeah, take care. There's a Guy Chambers yep. with Lady Poet. Um, let's go next to who is next. Let's go to Sharon Ferrante. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tim. Hey, Sharon. How are you doing tonight? Okay. Oh, thank you so much for the interview with James. You and James, I thank you both so much. Um, his honesty was beautiful and really needed. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, for oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I, I was really, yep. He, he almost like get, can give you confidence. Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to have to get his book. Yeah, I think you should. It's a great book. It really is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I wrote a prompt poem. I don't, I don't really know if it, really goes with the prompt yeah, that's as long as the poem came out that's yeah. all that matters <laughs> but it's it's what i thought of uh-huh. and it's the it's just a tarita my six line poem form that i love mm-hmm. doesn't have a title and it's not a long poem so i just wanted to explain what it was about okay um when i first started to tell people that i was a wiccan mm-hmm. a witch <laughs> So that's what I thought about with the format because it was quite emotional. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So let's go ahead and share. 
a quiet witch, reasons with the wind. She chimes, now melodious. I am, I am. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love that. That's a. I think that goes great with a prompt. It was pr beautiful little Churita. Thanks so much for sharing that, Sharon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, take care. You too. Thank you. Right. That was Sharon Fronte with um, the Churita, a quiet witch, we'll call it, by the first line. Yeah, excellent. Um, next, let's go to Bishwajit Mishra. Hi, team. Hi, everybody. Good hey. evening. Yeah, good evening. How are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm good. Thank you. I guess you guys are getting back to normal. Yeah, slowly. yeah, finally. <laughs> you know, all the, the streets, you know, the streets are still one lane except for the main road. But, but you know, we're sort of school started again. You know, they missed like 10 days wow. of school or something. So it's good, too. <laughs> so what do you have for us this week? Well, I have a pump poem. Uh, on a drum. So let me ask you, because you number your poems before we talk about it. And I assumed, <laughs> I assumed that this was like the record of poems you go in order, but this yeah, is only 21, and last week was like 360. So, so yeah, what do the numbers so mean? <laughs> yeah, it just I moved on to it because I started writing. I've never, I was never right. Uh, okay. I started writing, uh -huh. and then I said, after a week, I said, let me do it for 365 days. My wife was away in India for three months. Uh -huh, okay. So that's how I started keeping count. So what I did, uh, th those are a number of days I was writing. Uh -huh. so when I completed 365, uh, just recently, two weeks ago, uh -huh. I said, okay, I've <laughs> done it. I'm good or bad. At least I did something. Yeah. And uh, I had COVID. That's when I started. Mm -hmm. And that part is over. So now I start. <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me to find it. That's why probably there's no need for. Well, that's great. It's a good system. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, it's so now this is. Yeah. It's day 21 after 365. Mm -hmm. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is a, a prompt poem. So, so do you want to yes. say about it or do you want to jump right in? Okay. On and drum. I love walking in summer and fall. I run into ants on summery afternoons on the sidewalks, scurrying to whatever diligence they practice. And I run into swarms of mosquitoes in fall evenings. I wonder sometimes, how can I keep walking, watching my steps, not to trample the ants, or not palm swat the mosquitoes, rather enjoy my walk, surveying the surroundings. Those are no less lives than mine, and I'm a vegetarian after all. Or can I not lie yet and yet keep working, keeping my pay bonus all intact and growing with honesty? I'm an accountant after all. Or can I not finch, flinch and lay off people when tough time comes without having to justify why my position is more critical than theirs? I'm an executive after all. Or be a Mahatma and practice nonviolence zealously in my poems. Or like an ace lawyer once told me, no statement made, no lies told. Be an agnostic, that sounds early. Or be an open hymer and be an all-pervasive sustainer and a slayer with detachment. Oh, enlightenment. None smaller than the others, and I have plenty of folks in the woods, which in turn are toddlers. And if I tried to chart them, that would beat any program flow diagram with the sheer number of binary or best use my trumpet, the only potent, only present panacea that can wipe the slate clean with every swipe, leaving no need for a bamboo fiber pillow or sleeping pill. <laughs> Great humor at the end there. And that is quite the conundrum there. Have you ever read uh, Bob Hickok has my two favorite poems about firing people? Uh, you know, because he used to be a worker, own a tool and die you know shop and so he had to lay people off there's one that's like after the layoffs or and then there's no one like hiring someone back after the layoffs from um i don't know is it the legend of light i can't remember which book it is but just great poems um yeah and that's a, it's a tough thing and we don't see that perspective very, very often stressful. yeah i mean we can't explain they have no time to explain and they should not because somebody's losing a job mm -hmm. then somebody explain to your justification why it's yeah it doesn't matter they're losing a job mm -hmm. So it's very stressful. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that perspective, Bishop. It's always a yeah, pleasure. Well, yeah. Thank you, Tim. And have a good evening. Yep. But I'll, I'll, I'll just take one more, a few more seconds. Okay. With that meeting, uh, that um, interview today, mm -hmm. which is like my yesterday got extended. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, I, I had, I was talking to somebody who's going through a dark patch. Mm -hmm. It was so stressful, the stress predated to me. And uh, I, I didn't know what to do. We couldn't help. Mm -hmm. You're far away. We we're trying to convince to seek help. And it was stressful. So yeah. stressful. I wrote down a poem. And I even that I was posing because I'm thinking, I'm like, a, was it? There's a problem. And I'm writing to, I'm trying to write a poem because mm -hmm. the subject. But I couldn't stop. I said, I couldn't do anything. At least, at least that's a way of my probably sending my best wishes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that really rattled me for some time. And yeah. then next day I come and live this. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe a good a good book to give as a gift, to, you know, because at the end, you know, it's about getting through it ultimately, which is so important. To seek help. Yeah. That's the most important it part. It is. Mm -hmm. Most of it will work. But the seeking help is the most difficult part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much and have a good night. Yep. Thanks. You too. Always a pleasure. It was Bishwajit Mishra with Conundrum. Next up, let's go to um, Nate Jacob. Hey there. Hey, Nate. How you doing? Good. It's always nice to hear my voice. Or my, <laughs> my... It's terrible to hear my voice. <laughs> no, it's not. So, uh, In fact, I, I'd like to write a poem at some point for Jerry Stevenson to read because he's got the voice. <laughs> he does. That's a great voice. <laughs> Still keeps voice. So uh, let me see. And try to... Oh, there we are. There's a lot of poems in this inbox right now. Yeah. So what do you got for us? So I wrote a prompt poem, Excellent. Moral Dilemma. Mm -hmm. uh, mine's pretty shallow, let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> mine's about deciding when to uh, beat my kid at a board game. Oh, that's a tough thing. You know, so, you try to, there's ways you can you throw it, it without long. letting them know. Yeah, I know. They got to learn to lose a little bit. Dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, uh, let's hear. It's called, a, it's called a sorry win, only to learn my place. Since the very beginning, it had been in the cards that I'd find myself in the sorriest position ever. Let my son win again or teach him that life is hard. The kid was at the point of turning the last corner toward the safety of home's final approach. So close to winning again, though for the, la though for the very first time ever in his young and innocent life, he was winning at last without having benefited from my regular cheating in his favor. A habit and tradition honored since the past among all his older siblings and, even, and his even older mother. Otherwise, no one would ever play a second round of Scrabble nor Boggle. Maybe I'm a sore sort of w winner. But the cards were against him this time, and my heart and mind were ready to let the lessons of losing be learned. So I played that sorry card, sent him back to start, then leaned way back from the game board nervously. He looked at me as if my play had been unfair attack, bodily and vicious. I was playing, sorry, he was playing me. The outrage was all a fantastic act, the laughter almost cruel. He played the victim that day like he played me for a fool, thrilled to find the game field level. At last, his worthy, worthy competitor, equal in his mind at least. I see now, he'd long been my superior. <laughs> That's so funny. And I have my son Colin with chess not too long ago. Yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly like that yeah thanks for sharing that nate it is one of those Thank times <laughs> yeah take care thank you it was nate jacob with a, a sorry win only to learn my place um let's go to angela gartner next hi tim hey angela how you doing good you can't see me today but that's all right <laughs> that's all right so what have you got for us um i have the back in time to reread all the banned books from my youth ah yeah there's something going on all over the place for sure those book bannings <laughs> yeah and that was kind of my inspiration i've been thinking about it for months actually um i've wrote a couple i've written a couple poems about it it's just you know something that kind of weighs on me um you know i just i just don't understand mm -hmm. so 
<laughs> yeah, me neither. Yeah, words. They're squibbles on a page <laughs> and thoughts yeah. that people actually have. Yeah. All right. Well, let's hear it. Back in time to reread all the banned books from my youth. The worm that crawled out of the shiny red apple, his wired rim glasses, was on my mind when my teenage son told me he needed a classic book that was set in a time the lovesick millionaire hung around with flappers. I remember when I was sitting at my school library, me, her, sophomore year, I thought home was among the tall, dusty shelves. I wanted to read all about a bird who held its breath to sing afraid to be seen or wishing I could touch an empty sky when hidden or tickle the foot in the woods. I floated on the wooden chair, turning sharp corners of the pages miles away in the author's words. Wow. Is that the great Gatsby you're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> that was that was banned for what? <laughs> well, it's funny because um, I was, that's the book here he's reading right now. Uh-huh. And, you know, it kind of brought it back because, you know, I was thinking of all the other books that have been banned. And I was actually, I was actually looked up. The Great Gatsby was banned, like, wow. I mean, only once, like, years ago. Yeah, but, but I then can't I even imagine. Looking... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How could you have a but, complaint about that? <laughs> well, there is some parts, you know, I, I'm reading it, rereading it with him. Uh-huh. Um, and I could see why maybe they would ban it again, actually. <laughs> um, but it just, I mean, I i wouldn't want them to do that at all. But like, you know, if somebody reads it the wrong way, and that's why, you know, I was like, oh, well, that's good. I was thinking that that, that book is still going on. They're still reading that. But I looked up all the different, um, the American Library Association has like a 2022 banned book list. And, you know, it, it's great to kind of it's not great that they're banned, but it's great to, you know, try to kind of go through that list and maybe reread some of those that you've read. Mm -hmm. um, so I suggest everyone looks at the list and try to try to like read those classics that shouldn't be even the modern classics, you know, that are banned right now that, you know, we need to keep these books in circulation. I just remember going to my school library and discovering so many great authors and things I would never have discovered if I didn't go to my school library. And I think, you know, the school libraries now, they're the librarians I've heard from are, you know, some of them are, you know, they're fearful. So, you know, I think we need to get back to embracing all kinds of books. Yeah, totally agree. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for sharing that, Angela. Um, always a pleasure. Hope you have a good night. Always. You too. Thanks. Yep. Bye. It was Angela Gardner with, um, oh, what was it called? It was um, Back in Time to Reread All the Banned Books from My Youth. Okay. Next up, let's go to Carolyn Codd. Hello. Hi, Carolyn. How are you tonight? Okay. Uh, your snow looks pretty from down here. <laughs> I bet it does. <laughs> Not when you're in the middle of it, though. <laughs> no, no, no. It's awful. <laughs> So, Anyways, this is a this is a prompt poem, but um, when I saw the the prompt about moral dilemma, I was thinking about the larger things of the world and philosophical questions, and then I realized that I had a while back I had written a poem that I called dilemma. Oh, perfect! Yeah, and it's it. uh, it's my own inner dilemma about getting housework done, which I don't like to do. And my desire and my need to write. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's a dilemma. I think writing is important. But let's let's hear it. <laughs> dilemma. The plan to do some housework, but poems get in the way. Not really invited. Just showing up unexpectedly, like polite guests. Some sit and wait a while. Others are quite distracting and demanding of attention. A bit of half-hearted housework. Then the garden beckons, needing to be watered, claiming it can't wait. Eagerly, I answer its call. And if one or two poem sprouts want to accompany me, that's fine. There they don't distract. Instead, it seems they often take root during garden work. Soon the sun begins to set. The garden is quiet and satisfied. And I'm drawn back indoors. The writing table awaits me, that place where I have ideas a heap, and poems to write before I sleep, 
and maybe even while I sleep. <laughs> That's great. Love that last line. And that reminds me of uh, college myself, you know, all the classes I was supposed to go to, but that I'd rather read read books and write poems. <laughs> so sounds great. Thanks for sharing that, Carolyn. Thank you. Yep, have a good night. It's Carolyn Codd with uh, Dilemma. Uh, Bev Mundell Atherstone is next. We have a few people left, like three or four people on the line still. Hi, how are you? Good. How are you doing tonight, Bev? Great. I haven't been on for a while. I know. It's been a bit. And uh, what were you on? I think you were writing, was it Sestina's? You were writing a lot of something lately. What was it? Was it Sestina's? No. <laughs> I haven't been writing much of anything. Yeah. So uh, so I just got a poem published today by Spillwords. Oh, congratulations. That's great. Thank you. And so I'm going to read it, but I, I think my copy is a little different from yours. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, you froze. Hmm, are you there? Maybe turn off the video, Bev, if you can hear me, and, and I think the audio will come through better. Okay, I'll try. Okay. I don't know exactly what happened here. Yeah, just a bandwidth thing, I think. Yeah, your bandwidth yeah. is low. So just turn off the video. I'm trying, but I can't seem to find it. Oh, really? It should say stop video in the bottom. Or Alt-V if yeah. you're on a Windows. Yeah, I'm out of it. There you go. Oh, nope. that flipped it around. Nope, nope. <laughs> that was the wrong thing. <laughs> I don't know how to get out of it. Well, it's working fine now, so maybe it was just a temporary glitch. Let's. Okay. Okay. It's Qatar World. Oh, it's frozen again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, it's not cooperating right uh, now. Belly, the Workers' Cup. Somehow I'm in backgrounds. Hmm. Council. Well, it's it's kind of better. Like I see, because you have little bars next to your name. I think it, it was down low and now it's better. So maybe it'll be better right now. Let's just read it. Qatar World Cup Underbelly, the Workers' Cup. Like fish debated hooks, they took the lure and fled poor job prospects in Ghana, Kenya, and Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, and India for tales of better lives and playing soccer in Qatar. Aboard work buses with faces layered in kafiyas, hoodwinked, they peer out from tiny slits thus braced against the desert's angry blasts, where toil in heat and dust await in endless days. Needless deaths from tower falls make plain. Migrant workers are as replaceable as ants, duped, yet still they recruit their friends to this barren land, enticing them with myths they have begun to doubt, hoped for promised trips to visit wives at home and plans to save and build a house dissolved in meager pay. Imprisoned in their dreams with lives on hold, they ask each other, is this really living? One homesick worker stabs another, desperate and feigning mental illness. He hopes to be declared unfit to work, to be sent home to poverty familiar. The promised Workers' Cup games at last arrive. With selection of company workers' teams, hopes rise. Soccer players chosen outrank the other workers, although scoring players reap only mean rewards. Players gawk in disbelief as opposing teams they are coaches, not fellow workers. Their screams of fraud are eaten by the harmaton. The vaunted World Cup proves a mirage built on a rotting scaffolding of eviscerated truths to lure migrants to reject their impoverished freedom and instead to embrace lives of solitude. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Bevan. Definitely a poet respond type poem and uh, really heartbreaking. I didn't realize that the World Cup going on right now or recently. It was, it was, it was um, December, January. Yeah, that's funny. I can't I don't even remember that. You'd think it's the most popular sporting event in the world and 
and I'm right over my head. But thanks for sharing that, Bev. It's great to see you. Uh, good to see you again after a while. Thank you so much. Yep. Bye. There's bye. Bev Wendell Atherstone with Qatar or Cutter World Cup Underbelly, Cups. the Workers' Cup. Uh, let's go to Julian Matthews next. Hi, Tim. Hey, Julian. It's been a while since I've seen you too. How you doing? I'm good. Yeah. So what have you got for us? So the poem is called uh, Pitter Patter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know whether it's a moral dilemma, but it's a dilemma for me. Okay. Let's hear it. <laughs> Pitter Patter. You ask why I write so many I am sad poems. And I say my words are earthworms after rainfall. They breathe easier on the surface or else they'll drown with me underground. Some are easy pickings for birds hungry to serve. Some are in search of deeper graves. I'm wary of smiley happy people, those who claim to have it all together. The cheerleaders who are only there for the game but vanish when there's no applause to be gained. Too chill to understand, too cheerless to step into their own misery. I'd rather be real than play pretend. This is the mound I die on. It's a morbid calling I know, a failing grail quest, a never-ending path of broken trails. My wallowing is a fall of the wonder wall. Every night I creep down a crypt of deathly hallows. Depress, depression doesn't take a day off. You can't catch a break from loneliness. You can't take sick leave for being just sad. Some days are bad days just because. I no longer want this dread inside me. I put it out there as a salve, a, a reprieve, a relief. It's the long goodbye for this unburied pain. My poems are earthworms. Sensing the storm above, they hear the pitter-patter of rain, then arise to meet their maker. Depression is the dirt they crawl out of. Grief is a shallow grave, and I am its slave. Oh, Thank touching you. poem. Yeah, perfect for tonight, too. I love that metaphor, too, of the earthworms uh, sensing the storm above. Yeah, great poem and, and timely, too. Thanks for sharing that, Julian. Always a pleasure seeing you. Thank, thank you, Tim. Yep, take care. This is Julian Matthews with a Pitter-Patter. Yeah, wonderful poem. Uh, so we have two people left on the on the Zoom. Let's go to uh, Michael Ballard next. I think Michael is a first-time caller. Yes, I am. Hey, Michael. Yeah. Um, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. And uh, where are you calling from? Tucson, Arizona. Ah, excellent. So what do you have to share with us tonight? Uh, it's not a prompt call. Uh-huh. It's something I've been working on recently. It's called Celebration. Okay, great. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Celebration. It was a grand, sad time at Giuseppe's as we toasted our friend and wished him well on the next stop of his journey, some obscure pocket of the world called Albuquerque. And like many an occasion such as this, the wine and tears flowed and the food kept coming and the sad grand time slid by while nobody was looking. On the drive home, a peptic uproar ambushed my tummy and followed me into my bedroom where I spent the night propped up in bed so gravity could do its work and keep everything moving in the right direction. I woke the next morning free from any intestinal distress, marveling over the power and efficiency of those tireless enzymes, performing their quiet miracle during my fitful sleep. Life is like that, you know. From the day we're born, it's one long hail and farewell party where glasses are raised, drinks are spilled, and the feast goes on and on and on until everything settles into a surprisingly smooth and pain feed pain-free transition once we succumb to the bowels of the earth. Oh, very interesting. Great poem. That's a celebration. Thanks so much for sharing that. And uh, hope you share another one again soon. Thank you. I'll try. Yeah. Yeah. Take care. That was uh, Michael Ballard with uh, celebration. We're going to try to move quickly. We have um, three people now left on the call and uh, a few minutes left in the show. Let's go to Brian O'Sullivan. Hi, Tim. Hey, Brian. How are you tonight? Good. Yeah, it's a great show. Thanks. So um, I kind of bailed on the prompt for this week. I, I think I might have no morality and therefore no dilemmas. <laughs> um, so I uh, I have a prompt poem from a couple of weeks ago when we were responding to someone else's poem. Oh, it's yeah. called Players. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Players, an Irish-American sonnet to my great-grandmother. 
Yeats, you must have known Johanna Ryan O'Mahony. You must have thought of that jolliest old lady, that early heir of the hunger, when you wrote of gaiety transfiguring all that dread in players on the stage who know tragedy is a joyful show. When British soldiers plopped her husband down across from a goat and drove him away, and when young James was thought shot and the soldiers burned her house down, she barely frowned, and the only regret she owned was for the loss of a coveted four-star pack of players' smokes and the hundred-count tin she would have won. When old James turned up, she surely teased him about that goat. Her tools were crips and kitchen knives, not the pallet or the fiddle bow. Yet she teaches me what you mean when you say that their eyes, their ancient glittering eyes, are gay. I think her eyes are now set in the sky, amidst the spark from burning clonderine, laughing not unkindly at her children's, children's, children's tins and troubles. Ah, yeah, actually, I always love a good sonnet. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, yeah, there's a Players, an Irish American sonnet to uh, my great grandmother by Brian O'Sullivan. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Yep. Uh, okay, we got one more left. I think uh, Susan Talley was here, then popped out. So now, uh, Janthi Ranga is probably going to be the last. Hey, Janthi, how you doing? Um, I'm doing good. Ah, great to see you. And good to see you to a um, lovely show. Um, I'm going to read a poem called Split Loyalties. Um, so here it is. For adults, the inclines were a hard climb. But the kids ran those mounds well. The nine-year-olds led the grown-ups through the war sirens to the open clearing. There was chaos in the air, but my mother's vocals overtook all. Follow every word of mine, no questions. She partnered kids with one another, set guidelines and calmed our nerves. The quarter moon was the only flashlight and the sounds of plane, the rule breaker in the harsh sky. It was hard not to ask questions. Um, why had dad remained in the building? Would he be safe if a bomb fell? Yes, he would. No, he wouldn't. A World War II veteran, he had seen it all. Was he tired of wars? I needed to help him. No, I couldn't. I would sneak out of here and partner with him. He was alone. I need not escort my brother. Why should I join hands with Thumbi and not with Dad? My nose leaked a damp sniffle. My mother heard my silent thoughts and dragged me aside. aside. Your dad will be okay. I prayed with him and for him. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Shari. Some beautiful lines. I love the quarter moon was the only flashlight and the sound of a plane, a rule breaker mm -hmm. in the hush sky. It's great. Uh, split loyalties. Thank yeah, thanks so much. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Yep, take care. So you Jan too. Rangan with um, split loyalties. And that is going to be it for um, the open line. Sorry we're not going to be able to get to the people who emailed poems. There's just a huge... Um, a lot of poems here today. Um, I'm looking at like 15 extra poems that people sent in. Sorry, I can't get to anybody who is not on the Zoom this week because it's already two and a half hours and I have to eat, you know, eat some food and go to bed. <laughs> so um, that's going to be it for tonight. Let's do the Saiku really quickly, though. And the Saiku for this week was this right here. It was based on this article with some great pictures. It was all, one of those science articles. It was actually all over um, newspapers, too, and not just in science journals. This was um Ken, but I got it from Fizz Org, which is one of the websites I check regularly, once a week at least. And uh, here we go with this article. Um, this is uh, fix this really quickly. Um, can the dogs of Chernobyl teach us new tricks of on survival? And so what they did is they went through and did DNA testing on the dogs, the stray dogs, the packs of dogs that live there in Chernobyl. They've been living there for 15 generations, um, and they have genetic differences that can be measured in their DNA. 
that will help them survive somehow possibly. So this group of scientists went through and are studying the DNA of those 305 dogs from several distinct families. 302 dogs, I should say. It was a, a little metania there. Um, and so, so just fascinating to think about the dogs surviving in all of that fallout. One of the packs of dogs lives actually in the, um, the nuclear site. So um, here's my Saiku really quickly for that. There we go. Um, wait, that's not right. There we go. Obedience, the dogs of Chernobyl remain. Obedient, the dogs of Chernobyl remain. That is my Saiku for tonight. That is the show for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. Really great show with um, great open lines. Um, James Davis May was a great guest. Um, wonderful book and, and just really important topic too and, and great insight into it. Now next week's prompt is going to be inspired by uh, Jim's book. Um, he has a lot of poems in there that uh, are long sentences like I mentioned but they have really intricate syntaxes and go on and on in, in fascinating ways that never really let you pause. And killing his last poem, if you look back at the last poem he read, the new one, the whole poem, which is a, a good 25, 30 lines, is one sentence. And so your prompt for next week is to follow along with that and uh, write the longest poem you can in a single sentence. And let's see how that goes. How long can you keep a sentence going without it getting awkward? That is your prompt for next week. Next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be uh, Jennifer Reeser. Um, Jennifer, she's been on Rattle a bunch of times. She's a great, um, you know, she's a Native American poet, translates Native American poets. Um, she's also a formalist. Her newest book is Strong Feather, um, I think she just had uh, some translations of Anna Akmatova on Poetry Foundation's website today, I think I saw. Um, so she's a great translator, great poet in her own right. And we're going to talk about the new book, Strong Feather, which we've been waiting for for a good six months. I've had it on my shelf, waiting for the official release so she could have her on the show. That's going to be Rattlecast number 185 with Jennifer Reeser. Monday, March 13th, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great week, and I'll see you on Critique of the Week, maybe. I'll talk to you later. Have a good night.